All right, welcome, welcome, everybody, to High Side, Low Side, episode five of season seven. I'm Zach Spurge, is with me as always on the show today. It is the Moto Dating Game Part Two, where we help High Side, Low Side listeners choose their next motorcycle. Also, some talk about riding solo in the dirt, as well as a very special test ride at Get On Adventure Fest. And more, of course. But before we jump in, we need to have a word from our sponsor, Spurge. Motul is not just a sponsor of High Side, Low Side. It's also the oil that we reach for the most. And perhaps you've missed our recent CTXP episode. But in that episode, we actually had an oil change challenge. And when it was time for an oil change challenge for beginner bikes, what oil do we reach to? Ah, we reached for a good old quart of Motul for all of our bikes that we needed to change oil on, except for the bike that Zach was on because Sondors, well, there's no oil to change there. But if you're ready to change the oil in your beginner bike or any other motorcycle you have in your garage, make sure you reach for Motul and you can find that at revzilla.com slash M-O-T-U-L. Also, I think it goes without saying that another proud sponsor of this podcast is revzilla.com itself. For every purchase you make, whether it's a helmet, a jacket, a glove, a pair of boots, a little bit of that money goes to pay for programs like this. So if you like the programming that Revzilla is bringing to you, make sure you just check out all the products that we have for sale at revzilla.com. And while you're there, you can also check out the Riders Plus membership program. You can learn all about the special discounts you can get and much, much more at revzilla.com slash RPM. Okie dokie, everybody. Welcome again into our respective studios, bi-coastal studios, <laughs> Spurgeon at Revzilla HQ in Philadelphia, and uh, and me here in uh, Revzilla West in Los Angeles. Uh, it's time for another high side, low side journey. But before we dive into our actual topic, as usual, we'd like to give ourselves three minutes to talk about a not the news topic. Spurge, what are you talking about this time again? So we're going to dive into the CF Moto Ibex 800. Uh, yeah. uh, the reason that we're going to bring this up as a topic is because Zach and I, along with Ari Henning, recently got to ride this motorcycle at Get On Adventure Fest in the Mojave Desert. We got about a day with it split three ways, and we feel that this is a good one to dive into. There's going to be a three-minute discussion, and then if you want more information, Zach, there is an article over on Common Tread, I believe, where they can read more if they want more information. Correct Amundo. That's the plan as it stands. Uh, um, you can go over there and uh, read each of our opinions and decide who is right and who is wrong. For now, Chase, start the timer. Spurgeon, tell the people what they need to know about the A Ibex 800. The Ibex 800 is a motorcycle manufactured by CF Moto, and it's the real story here is that it's the platform of KTM's 790 Adventure. KTM mm. went to CF Moto and they said, "Hey, we want you, we want to bring this bike back, and we want you to produce it for the masses." So not only is the new KTM 790 Adventure going to be produced by CF Moto um, with the KTM badge on it, but now CF Moto is creating a platform of their own using that chassis. Right. Oh, so. Ultimately, what the question is, is can a Chinese supplier of KTM engines that has decided to create a motorcycle unto itself, uh, does that, is that motorcycle any good, basically? Uh, the, and and I, I think that it's kind of a big question, right? It's sort of, does it, I mean, did it feel like a KTM engine to you? It felt like a KTM engine. The, the chassis did not feel like a KTM chassis. Yes. So the engine, the engine reminded me very much of a, of a, of a KTM. Um, what I will say is that it was, it was kind of like, uh, it, it wasn't like a KTM 790. It reminded me more, and, and keep in mind, audience, that if you're listening to this, the Husky Norden 901 is built off of the, the similar platform. It kind of reminded me more of like a poor man's uh, Norden 901. Or a souped-up mm, okay. V-Strom 650, somewhere in between there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It certainly has a unique um, interface with the, the sort of dash and control set, and uh, it looks very unique. I think it, I think it's pretty cool looking. Actually, it doesn't look like a copycat of anything in particular. It kind of has its own uh, its own its own vibe, um, and largely seems more road oriented than a KTM adventure bike, midsize adventure bike. Um, and to Spurgeon's point, maybe more in sort of a V-Strom kind of vein, but also like a little, maybe maybe a little bit more rugged than that, a little bit more rough and tumble than than a straight up sort of road going 19 inch front wheel ADV. 
So, I, so that, that I, well, that's a that's a good delineation. Is that the KTM product has a 21 inch front wheel? Yes, this true, one true, has true. a 19 inch. The other thing to note is the suspension is completely different. And if for all you Norton 901 <laughs> owners out there, I apologize, but the suspension on the Norton 901 is not nearly uh, the same suspension that's on like a base 890. So I would say that the suspension that's coming on the the Ibex, you know, for 40 miles down the highway seems a bit more competent than what you would get with the Norton 901. There's more adjustability. Um, oh. I'm, I'm blanking off the top of my head as to who the manufacturer is for the suspension. Do you remember off the top of your head? It'll be in the article. I but I just... Yeah, I don't remember either. I feel like it's Showa. Is it I a Showa? Say, I, wanted, I wanted to say Showa, but I, then I was like struggling KYB with like KYB. Makes more sense, though. Yeah. Anyway, either whatever. way. Either way, um, <laughs> I, I think that it's going to be an impressive motorcycle. The, the price is right. I think it's under $11,000 for the fully souped up version, if that sounds correct. Something on that, like that note, yeah. the alarm is going off. It's terrorizing me because it, again, reminds me of waking up in the morning. <laughs> uh, so we can we can wrap it up there. But Zach and I, along with Ari Henning, got to ride the new Ibex 800. Um we have some first thoughts up on the the internet on Common Tread. You can check that out and, and get all of our initial impressions of exactly what you can expect if you are shopping for a new Ibex 800 from CF Moto. And quick uh, quick note, photos by Spencer Robert. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit bit of a rare thing, uh, but he is a, he's a fine photographer and uh, shot some pretty cool photos of the bike. So worth checking out if you like pictures of motorcycles so moving so, on moving on from the news um yes this is the first time that zach and i have gotten to talk to you uh live post get on adventure fest and that kind of gives you a an idea of how we've recorded some of this stuff but it was nice seeing all of you out there in the deserts <laughs> of uh of california and for those of you that missed it um maybe zach and i will see you again in south dakota in july if you want more information about that you can uh, check out the get on adventure fest page on revzola.com but we had a good time out there it was a lot of fun riding adventure bikes for four or five days with you we did. We did. It was hotter than the hinges of heck, but mm. uh, but but a good time riding motorbikes around. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see uh, some of you in South Dakota. But it's time to lean into the motorcycle dating game, people. This is yes. this is now the second time that we've done this, and uh, the first time we had so much fun. We got a lot of responses from people that um, Zach and I actually we we reached out to listeners um, asking for. You know, what are they looking for out of a motorcycle? Would they like to be a, a contestant on the motorcycle <laughs> dating game? And essentially, this is where Zach and I take your facts of who you are as a human being, and then we use our scientific brains and knowledge to tell you what motorcycle you should get. Does that sound about right to you, Zach? Yes, indeed. So these are, um, with, with a couple of slight exceptions, little tweaks that we made, these are high side, low side listeners that wrote in with... Uh, they filled out a dating game bio with a bunch of information, which we will present in a moment here. Um, and then we picked, uh, you know, put them in a hat and, and picked them out. So we, we appreciate all of the many people that sent in information about themselves and the bike um, uh, sort of parameters that they're, that they're interested in for us to discuss. And if you did not get chosen, we are, we are very sorry, but we still appreciate your viewership and listenership. We got a lot of responses. So one, we I did, wanted to just did. say thank you for everyone yes. that took the time to do that. And two, uh, if this is an episode that you like, shoot us an email uh, to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. Let us know that you like the episode and let us know that you would like to be considered if Zach and I were to ever do a motorcycle dating game version mm -hmm. three. So, <laughs> okay, with that, let's jump in to the first contestant of the Moto Dating Game Round 2. It's time for Nick. Nick, and let's, and let's, come let's hype on this down. up a little bit. All right, Nick, I'm, let's I'm, come on down, baby. Okay, would you, would you would you like to do it, Spurgeon? I just I think you should get it. Come on, I want I want to hear you. Like this is a this is a dating game. I want to see like a '70s persona from Zach Kortz. It's like, give me your best contestant coming down. Price is right, Bob Barker. You know what? I, I think you should take the lead. I think you have you have better vision for it. You show me uh, what you want. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, our first contestant is Nick. Nick is 31 years old, weighs in at a commanding 165 pounds, stands at 5'11", 31-inch inseam on Nick, and he's a professional cubicle occupier. My God, Nick, that sounds enthralling. 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, fun fact on Nick, he did apply to work at Revzilla once. However, he got a nice email from HR noting that he wasn't qualified. Well, Nick, I'm sorry to hear that you're not one of our coworkers, but frankly, today you're one of our guests, which is even more important because I'm going to treat you better than I treat Zach. So that, that's how I would do it if I were, if I were, you know, maybe, maybe you try it next time. But yeah, that's, that's <laughs> Nick. Uh, does Nick have any other parameters for the bike that he wants or the budget or considerations that he's made? Well, I was just giving the introduction to Nick. Now. I will let you take over. I uh, see. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to pizzazz that it doesn't... up for like the who he is, his little bio background. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Continuing on for Nick. <laughs> uh, Nick's been riding for five years. Uh, Nick is uh, a sort of average mechanic. Uh, n- not not uh, not tooting his own horn about his own mechanical skills. Nick is looking to add a second bike to accompany his Royal Enfield Himalayan for interstate and or 65 mile an hour county road daily commutes. Uh, he likes the idea of a late gen VFR 800 from Honda or potentially a Kawasaki versus 650. Um, also occasional weekend day rides are a consideration as long as, as, as well as long weekend trips. Nick's budget is $4,500. Mm. That's not very much, that's not very much budget for Nick here. I like so, the fact that Nick wrote in, and, and Zach kind of walked through this, but uh, Nick wrote in, he goes, I'm very good at taking carburetors apart. I'm not so good at putting carburetors back <laughs> together. That was how right. he explained his mechanical uh, prowess, which I thought was pretty good. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. So uh, the, I'm, I'm glad that this, is a, that this is a topic that we're going to cover here, because if there's ever been a debate between Spurgeon Dunbar and myself, it would be between a VFR 800 and a Versus 650. And it sounds like Nick is is sort of like rolling those two around in his head. And I think we know where this is going. You're, you're going to be very pro VFR 800, are you not? Yeah, you're going to be pro uh, uh, Versus 650, are you not? How, how could I not be? Exactly. So I think the reason that we picked Nick's comment wasn't because we wanted to um, introduce additional models to Nick's choice, but I think Zach and I were just looking for an excuse to debate uh, VFR 800 and <laughs> versus 650, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I, I will say that um, for $4,500, and given uh, Nick's wrenching experience, I, I think a fifth-gen VFR 800 is probably the way that I would lean. And I think it's important to note for people that are trying to figure this out, when you get into the sixth-gen VFR, that's when they introduce the VTEC. It gets much more expensive to maintain. Um, mm. it, it's not as It's not as easy. Uh, of of a of a job, and especially if he's paying somebody to do valve checks or or maintenance uh, for him, and this is something that Lance Oliver is dealing with now uh, in his his newest gen VFR because he's got to have to pay to have the valves redone, and I know that it's going to cost him an arm and a leg, so or the <laughs> valves checked rather because of the VTEC system. So um, right. I, I think that for his forty five hundred dollars, um, you can probably find a, a really nice fifth gen VFR. The one thing that I will note for you, Nick, is that if you're looking at doing um, interstate travel, you know, daily commutes, uh, 65 miles, uh, you know, the, the problem that you're going to run into with the VFR that you're not going to run into for the Versys, and this is a little tip of the hat to the Versys 650, is that it's going to be pretty difficult to get luggage for a fifth gen VFR. Um, mm. Sixth gen did have uh, easier luggage accommodations, but the, the fifth gens did not. And you can get a Versys 650 with luggage on it for probably a $4,000 price range for a used one yeah i think so yeah yeah i think so i appreciate that what nick said was that love nick says quote love the idea of a fifth or sixth gen vfa 800 but wonder if the practicality of versus 650 would be better suited so i can appreciate that you know nick can appreciate the the difference between something that would work well and something that would be exciting to ride and i guess i with that in mind so versus 650 is kind of an upright um, quasi ADV riding position, but it's very much a street bike um, that has a kind of standard issue run of the mill, not very exciting Kawasaki parallel twin. And then the Honda VFR 800 is much more kind of like sleek and sexy, and uh, of course has its kind of the classic V4 engine, which as Spurgeon points out is complex, but also exciting and it makes an awesome sound and that kind of thing. So I got I got something for you, Spurge. What about a first gen Yamaha FJ09 for? Mm. Mm. For Mr. Nick, because then you get you get that uh, Yamaha, um, you know, MTO nine triple, the first uh-huh. gen uh-huh. one anyway, or the yeah, the first gen one, um, 
and which is a spicy engine, very fun, like yeah. raucous, uh, interesting engine to use. Um, maybe not as classy as a VFR 800 engine, but 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 a fun engine. Fun and engine, then you also yeah. get the sort of practicality in the seating position of a of a Versus 650, more or less. I like where your head's at. I think that the the cautionary note there um, is that that first that first gen. Uh, what, what was it called? What was the? Didn't the first gen have a different name? Because it's now it's the F tracer. FJ09 was F FJ. Okay, you were right. So yeah, yeah. FJ09. That's what's now is called the tracer. So if you're looking at this in Yamaha's lineup, it's Correct. now the tracer. Um, yeah, I should have mentioned that. But that first gen FJ09 had the shorter swing arm, and like, there was a spicy meatball. Like if you pulled back on the <laughs> throttle a little bit too hard, like even in like third gear, you could you could whack it. You could whack it pretty good and get that front wheel off the ground without <laughs> without breathing on the throttle too much. So, I would just say depending, it's, it sounds like Nick might be coming from a um, a uh, uh, you know a Himalayan, which might be a little bit more uh, entry entry level. Maybe maybe Nick's first or second bike. I think maybe making the jump to that Yamaha engine might be a bit much. Um, and I'm speaking as a, a VFR. I think the VFR was a bit of a tamer bike. It was also a heavier bike. Um, right. it, it made it made some top end power. But I, I think realistically, if if you were getting 90 horsepower at the rear wheel with a VFR, you were doing pretty good. Um, and it came on much more reasonably. I think <laughs> while I love that Yamaha Triple, it's it's like a punch to the throat. You know, as soon as you get above like 1500 RPM. While we are talking about things that are not good about that. F early FJ09 or the the you know the FJ09 uh, throttle response. Model. What's that? Throttle response. Yeah, throttle response not great. Also, but in general, the Tracer Nine. If you go to a Yamaha showroom now and you go up to a Tracer Nine GT, and you look at this the the dash, you look at the the switch gear, you look at the adjustable windshield, you look at the luggage. All that stuff has has taken a big step forward from that first gen bike. The first gen bike was like I don't want to. I don't want to say chintzy, but it was, it was a little bit. Uh, it was raw budget, yeah. Um, and 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 as a result, um, it's yeah. It's it's like it doesn't. It's not that it's a flimsy uh, bike to use or or sort of like unruly in in any kind of like build quality kind of way. Uh, it just it doesn't have. It's not going to have the the feel or the precision of a VFR 800 or even a, a later model Yamaha Tracer 9. But I still yeah. think that's a that's a decent suggestion. Though. Well, the other the other thing, so going back, Nick is 5'11 with a 31-inch inseam, which reminds uh, me very much of Spurgeon Sr. Spurgeon Sr. <laughs> very much struggled when I brought that FJ09 home from a height what? perspective. No. He it was he was very tippy-toed on that bike. Well, I don't want to insult uh Spurgeon Sr. Spurgeon but... Sr. is a rider that likes to have both feet flat in the ground. Okay, fair enough. Well, that's that's not uh, that's not so bad. I mean, I, I can I can appreciate that. But the he listens the, to this oh, podcast, yeah. so if you want to insult him, I would just continue with what you're going to say. No, no, that's why I want to be very careful with what I say because I know that Spurgeon <laughs> Senior is a loyal uh, listener, um, and and I would I would hate to offend him. But now, that, so I just googled it, and uh, and the, the seat height is kind of high yeah. on that on that first FJ09. It is is 33. 33 plus inches. Yeah. So that's actually a very good point, Spurgeon. I appreciate you bringing that up. I thought your dad was a ninny, but he's not. No. It's actually a, it's a somewhat tall bike. Well, anyway, it depends on Nick's uh, confidence and experience there, but it will be taller and more, uh, much rowdier than your Himalayan Nick. But, you know, uh, but I, but I think that's a that's a decent compromise. Just what else can you think? No, I would say yeah. Before we move on from uh, from Nick, you know, you're you're talking about the the FJ09 reminded me of a bike, and it, you know what I like about what I like about the motorcycle dating game, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> boys and girls, is that it allows Zach and I to go back and explore used motorcycles. I think a lot of time in motorcycle journalism, people end up talking about new bikes and what's out in the market. But I love the fact that we can go back and talk about bikes that maybe are a little bit, you know, uh, for, from foregone generations. Sure. And if you're looking at a VFR 800, um, you should also consider a Triumph uh, Sprint ST from like a mm. 2006, 2007 uh, gen, um, which has that big 1050 triple in it. The other 1050 triple, going back to Zach's recommendation for the FJ09, is T Triumph used to make a Tiger Sport with 17-inch wheels and matched hard bags and a 1050 triple engine in it. Um, I don't think it was called a Tiger Sport here. I think it was just called a Tiger 1050 in America. Yes. Um, yep. 
which is it's getting I'm, I'm cheating for a recommendation that I have for a Norwegian fellow in a little bit um, but we're, <laughs> we're not there yet um, what I will say is that I, I think that a Tiger 1050 or a Sprint uh, uh, ST 1050 would be other recommendations to consider in the used market you can usually find them uh, for around the, the four to five thousand dollar range there you have it also a 33 inch seat height Oh, for what it's worth. Ah, okay. So you know, you know, you know, you know, you know. with the Sprint ST too. Uh, I feel like the Sprint ST was was a lower seat no, height. No, that's true. But that's a bigger bike, though. It's also just kind of like heavier. it's very it's very VFR eight hundred y. Um, I mean, <laughs> yeah. if, if we're looking at no, a VFR eight hundred, it's another one to compare. And what I like about the, that, I, I personally, um, and and I say this because I bought a VFR eight hundred, and my my best buddy at the time bought a Sprint ST, and I was very jealous that he got the Sprint until I got a chance to ride them back by back to back. I think the VFR eight hundred was probably a little bit more refined, um, which is Honda. That's what they do. Um, yep. But the the luggage options and, and getting some some color matched luggage that looked the part and finding a used model that includes luggage, you'll probably have a better uh, uh, chance of doing that with the Sprint ST. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, how about uh, I got a bike for you, Spurgeon Dunbar? What about BMW F800 GT? Mm -hmm. So you get that's a it's a that's a fared sport touring uh, kind of bike. You can get um, factory luggage for it, belt drive. I was just saying that's the belt that's the belt drive version, right? Mm -hmm, belt drive. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, I don't know how much they're going for in the used market, but it can't be very much. <laughs> and that's not to say that it's not a good bike because it, it works fine. Um, certainly less. Um, it, it, the reason I'm suggesting that, uh, shooting from the hip is that you sort of said, well, Nick's coming from Royal Enfield Himalayan, mm -hmm. uh, a Yamaha FG09 might be a little bit too high octane mm -hmm. or a little bit too fiery, a, a, an animal to have in the, in the stable F800 GT, much less fiery for what um, it's worth. It, I like that bike. I think that bike is, I, I yeah. think that bike is very underrated. Um, I, I think the engine in that has got a lot of, you know, charisma and charm in its own right it's not anything that's going to set the world on fire but it's correct it's a lovable little engine and i think that that package uh especially because you can get like you said that the bags for it i think that's a great bike and i think it looks mm -hmm. kind of cool and unique well nick didn't mention luggage did you nick i'm, I'm now maybe now i'm just checking. maybe I, well he said well i don't know maybe he was talking about the maybe because i was thinking about the practicality of a versus 650 anytime right, i right. hear the word practicality it's something he mentioned, wants to commute on he wants to have luggage for it right, right. mentioned mentioned the practicality also mentioned that uh, that he is a quote professional cubicle occupier so you know there's a, there's a certain amount of um commuting you know yeah certain, certain I take that commuting you take that there. yeah back and forth you gotta get a little lunch pail that you want to take with you and you want to put it securely yeah. in a luggage container so so as a, as a wrap-up for nick we've got uh, a BMW F800 GT suggestion. We've got a, a Yamaha FJ09 suggestion. We've got his suggestion of a VFR800 or a Versus 650. Also, your suggestion of um, a Triumph uh, Sprint ST or a Triumph, uh, what was it, the Tiger 1050? Yep. From way back when. Yep. Um, what do you what 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 do you what are you thinking right now? What, what, what do you what's your off, what's your pick? off the top of my head? Like if you, it goes back to Nick's original picks. Like I think that um, the Versi 650 is probably the way to go for Nick. If I if I mm. if I had to mm -hmm. really think holistically about what bike he's going to be the happiest on, at least as like a next step, um, right. I, I think the Versi 650 is going to be probably almost double the horsepower of what he's currently used to uh, right. with the Himalayan. Right. Double, triple, quadruple the braking power. <laughs> um, he's got adjustable suspension. Like right. I, I think, I think moving up to a Versi 650 is going to offer him is going to offer him practicality as well as like it's going to be it's going to be a nice upgrade in performance as well. I think that the the biggest problem with the suggestion of a BF, BMW F800 GT is a Versi 650, mm -hmm. which is arguably just a better bike. And it's sort of like more, more ubiquitous, for, more affordable to maintain. Affordable There's gonna be more yeah. aftermarket parts for it. Like I think bigger fuel tank, better range, better better factory luggage. So yeah, I it's and let's let's. I think this is a good place to start this um, this dating game as well because the Versus 650 is just gonna come up a lot. You know, it unfortunately whatever you want to do, especially especially as long as I'm a part of this god podcast, the Versus 650 is just a it's a, just a good it's just a good bike. It's it's a uh, and let's not sell, sell, system, sell the fact short that I, I can find a recommendation for a VFR 800 almost anywhere. Um, right. So like, I would I, like, maybe I'll save that one for later. 
<laughs> right. I want my first track bike. VFR 800. Yeah. I want to get into dirt riding. VFR 800. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well I, I feel good about that exploration about, of, for Nick's, uh, Nick's next motorcycle. How about you? I think that the next step for Nick is if he wants to try one, Ari Henning is renting out his <laughs> <True>. personal... Uh, <laughs> his, you could take a vacation to Southern California, rent out Ari Henning's personal um, uh, Versi 650, and uh, see how you like it on a, on a road trip, Nick. Do it. Perfect. Perfect. I'm not perfect. promoting we really Henning's, that one uh, Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let's right. move on to our next persona. Zach, why don't you give us your best introduction for <laughs> Joe? Next up is Joe, otherwise known as Joe Steen. Joe Yostein? Yostein? I'm not, I'm not really sure. Let's just go with Joe. Joe is from Norway which is very, very exciting. Joe was 31 years old, six foot two, 225 pounds with a 34 inch inseam. Joe works at an office, um, but occasionally commutes up to two hours to meet with clients. Um, who knew that Norway was even that big? We're learning stuff left, right, and center here on High Side, Low Side. Fun facts about Joe. Uh, Joe likes hiking, fishing, and working out. That sounds very Norwegian to me. <laughs> six years of riding experience. Um, moderate wrenching experience, knows uh, their way around an engine, but won't take on a full rebuild. The budget for Joe, oh, sorry, excuse me, considerations for Joe's next bike. Used to own a naked bike, but now has a 2017 KTM 1050 Adventure. Um, however, could always look for more comfort. Joe needs to be able to carry PPE to work and gym clothes for after work. Mm. Um, the last thing Joe says is that uh, Joe struggles a lot with wind noise on any ADV bike that they ride. Joe's budget, 9000 to 15000 United States dollars. I like the fact that Joe put this in United States dollars just to help us yeah. understand. We assume, yeah. we assume that's not euros or Norwegian Krona. Krona or whatever. Krona. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so Joe's current bike, um, just a fun fact for those of you listening. Mm -hmm. the, oh, that's uh, that's, that's uh, your previous bike, is it not? Well, no, the 1050 was never available in America. So that's what I was going to say. In no, America, we got the 1090. Um, I don't ah, think. Right. I don't, I don't think enough, the 10, you're right, yeah, you're right, you're 1050 right. was never brought into America. So he has a right. he has a European only KTM model. Mm, interesting, interesting. So the upshot here with Joe. Joe sometimes takes uh, two hour trips to meet clients. Joe likes to ride to work. Joe likes to be able to carry gym clothes for post work work out, and also struggles with wind protection on ADV bikes and like you know turbulent wind, like wind noise, that kind of thing. So what's your what's your um, I'm guessing your for your first your first instinct spur is going to be 890 adventure right obviously just get a newer KTM that's the no I can't do that it, it, well so here, it's interesting <laughs> Zach and I were talking before the program about this because you know it, until we read his last comments you know and Zach and I uh, we often talk about wind noise in general um, and we talk about windshields and it was actually something that came up when I was riding the Ibex 800 which we talked about earlier, as low as I put the windscreen, it just didn't, it didn't work for me um, whilst rolling down the highway. Uh, and, and oftentimes, I like a very minimal windscreen. I like mm -hmm. little to nothing at all. Um, but my, my concern here is that um, a two-hour commute to meet a client, like some kind of wind protection on mm -hmm. the highways mm -hmm. seems advantageous. So right. adventure bike, maybe too much wind protection, naked sport bike, not enough wind protection and nowhere to put his <laughs> his his PPE and his gym clothes. Like, I feel like we're looking for something in the middle. What's a, what's a naked sport bike with a little bit of wind protection and luggage? Are we looking at a Tiger 660? Are we looking at you know, a European only model. We, we talked earlier about the Tiger 1050, and I said this was going to come up again. So here, here you, you go, American you audience. <laughs> um, the Triumph makes a Tiger Sport in in uh, uh, Europe, if I'm not mistaken. They still make that bike, and that's a 1050 triple, um, which is like a big mm. adventure looking thing, but mm -hmm. it's a sport bike. Well, I think that bringing up the Tiger Sport 660 is also not a bad idea mm -hmm. because that's a that's like you know you get you can get your factory luggage on there and you can get your um, you can get your wind protection. But I, you, you know, think the windscreen is too high on that for him? This is the thing. You either Joe, you either need to search for a bike uh, on which adjusting the windscreen will be um, feasible or easy. And when I say adjusting it, I don't just mean adjusting the factory one up and down. I mean trying different windscreens on there. You know, that's one thing that uh, you can do with 
I don't know, say a versus 650. <laughs> um, the, the windshield goes up shameless. and down. You are shameless. Factory. I don't know, it's just shameless. But you can also just get a larger windscreen or a smaller windscreen. You can take the windscreen off. You can sort of like, you can play around with all kinds of different things and different options. And I think that sounds like what you need to do is start fiddling with um, your your available options there. Our old, uh, Ari and I, our old boss at Motorcyclist Magazine, Mark Cook, he used to, he used to take his windscreens um, and he would find one that he liked pretty well and then he would shape it with a saw. He would like, he trimmed, I remember he trimmed like an inch or an inch and a half off an aftermarket windscreen with a bandsaw and then sanded it down just to get the right amount of, of wind protection for, for what he wanted. And I think if you, if you have the, the drive to, to mess around with it, that's a really good option, especially if you're going to be, you know, commuting on it and, and spending a lot of time in the saddle. So I think it's interesting that he. So that's a, that's a good point about the windscreen. And like you have you have that KTM 1050. Try taking the windscreen off. Try riding it without the windscreen. You know, see mm-hmm. how that like use that as like a first yep. step. Um, but he does say, however, my life. So he makes the comment about how the bike that he owns now, the the 1050, and he says, however, my life could always get more comfortable and easier to use. So <laughs> it sounds like maybe he wants something more comfortable than the that- current uh, adventure bike that he's on. Right. Um, you know, his budget of, of nine to fifteen thousand dollars gives us a lot to play with here. You yes. know, you could look into maybe uh, what's the what's the well, so the other thing I'm struggling with too is he's six <laughs> foot two, two hundred and twenty five pounds, thirty four inch. I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking Joe in the eye, right? So like he, I, I see a lot of myself <laughs> in Joe. Um, what about what's the what's the new Moto Guzzi Sport Tour? Uh, the the V100 Mandelo, yes, that's one that I that comes to mind. Ducati Multistrada, no, maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, no? Multistrada. I think in general, wind protection is quite good on a Multistrada. Um, I'd go probably Multistrada 950 or Multistrada mm-hmm. V2, depending on yep. what generation you're going with. Every time I every time I've ridden a Multistrada 950, I've thought this is fantastic. And granted, now the flagship is a V4, so it's a whole different animal. But like the 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 mid-sized Multistrada 950 is big. It's fast. It's that engine's great. It's got yeah. all. It's got the heated grips. It's got all the options. It's got cruise control. It's got all the things you want. And it's it would a stay. It bike. would stay more within the the price range that we're trying to right, to right, hit right. For, for especially Joe. if you got like a used 950 or something like that. Yeah. Here's 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 a curveball I'd like to throw into the conversation. Sometimes, like for example, right now, um, I'm I've been test riding two different motorcycles for upcoming daily rider episodes one is a kawasaki z650 rs so that's mm-hmm. the uh, sort of retro styled uh mid-sized naked bike from from kowalski and then also a uh zero dsr x which is the all electric um adventure styled bike from zero and it has a it has a sort of a an adventure style fairing on it like sort of a, a snub nose and a, and a sort of mid-sized windshield on it and I can't get the windshield goes up and down, but I can't get it to be in a place where it doesn't just sort of put turbulent air near my helmet. And one thing that I noticed as I listened to um, music or listen to the radio on the on the way to and from work on those two different bikes is I can actually hear things in my headset better on the naked bike than I can on the bike with the fairing because the um, windshield, like I said, dumps turbulent air in and around my helmet no matter what I do with the adjustment of it. Mm-hmm. So that's something to consider is that sometimes what I've noticed is that my favorite bikes for comfort, even for a two hour trip to see a client say Joe, um, would be something that takes the wind off your chest and your stomach. Um, so it does, so you're not like pulling on the handlebars to like, you know, fight the wind. Um, but also leaves your helmet in clean air. It does not, it does not try to protect your entire helmet from the wind, which is going to be hard to do, uh, for a fella your size. So that's it's it's so it's it's super interesting because that's the kind of wind protection that I look for. Um, I, I like just like even with the the Bonneville and the cross country trips that I've taken with that motorcycle. Take a drink. Take a drink. Um, I have a little clip on windscreen <laughs> that I put on just for that, just to keep it off of my chest and give my yeah. my my neck a little bit of a break. I wanna I wanna pivot, and you know, oftentimes I don't think we talk about cruisers enough now. I think with Joe's Whoa. size, I think with Cruiser Joe's size, wow. yeah, um, I, I worry that it's, he's going to be a bit cramped. Um, the one thing that I would say, you know, two, two bikes come to mind, Harley Davidson's street glide 
is a bike that I have found comfortable uh, for for my size for for longer distances. I've I've enjoyed that. It has a little bit of a of a you can get like a little baby screen for it, so it's not really creating too much buffeting. Um, there's a big bat wing fairing on the front, um, and and I think the there's a special version that has a nicer suspension for Joe's size. The other bike was the um, the BMW K1600. Um, there's a GT, there's a B, there's a couple different versions of that bike. Um, mm. Used, we might be in that fifteen thousand dollar range. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a K16 is a that's quite a machine. Certainly, if you get your hands on one of those, the wind protection is quite good. I would be surprised. Uh, normally, BMW touring models, the K1600 and the R, the R1250 RT, R1200 RT, those are bikes that have. Uh, very comprehensive wind protection, almost no matter how big you are or small you are. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate the uh, bringing American V twins into it or cruisers at the very least. But I rode a street glide from Wyoming to Los Angeles a few years ago, and I did not like it. It was it just rattled my helmet the whole time. I could not get the 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 wind protection to to work for me. So it's it's yeah. going to be a it's it's going to be a tricky thing to balance there for sure. Just but the, to, just what about a cruiser that doesn't have any wind protection, ostensibly, like a Rocket 3 or a Diavolo or something like that? Yeah. Like those are cool, fun bikes, and they're pretty comfortable. So just backing up for a second for the audience that's listening. So we talked well, you about started a, this whole no, no, thing. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. I did a bad job. So <laughs> a Harley-Davidson Road King is a, is a big American V-twin. Oh, pump, pump the brakes, pump the brakes. You talking uh, Road King? You talking sorry, Street Glide? Street Glide. You started okay. talking about naked ones, and I went in a different direction in my head. Uh, <laughs> Street Glide, large American V-twin, um, floorboards, Batwing fairing, lots of wind protection, and, uh, and just a, just a quick sidebar there. Batwing fairing means it is a fork mounted fairing, so the the fairing is attached to the handlebar, not attached to the frame. Continue. Nope, I, the great points. And then <laughs> when Zach and I were talking about the the K sixteen hundred uh, from BMW, there's a GT version, there's a there's a B version, um, and that's a big uh, that's a big six cylinder motorcycle, um, mm -hmm. and it's a. It's an inline six. It's not a. It's not a, 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 a boxer six. So it's a big inline six that is just a, a honking mass of technology and power, basically. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And then the two cruisers I brought up for what it's worth, the Triumph Rocket Three is a um, behemoth, approximately the size of a, a Class D RV. It's, uh, it's I think ridiculous. It's Ninety five. Hundred pounds, something. Two, like it's 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 got a twenty three hundred cc. It's it's the same size mm -hmm. engine that my Mazda three hatchback had in it. I had a two point three <laughs> right. liter. Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, Rocket three is a very large engine and a, and a large heavy motorcycle in general. But uh, Joe here in Norway is a is a large rider, so I think they'd be able to handle. Are you okay? Just I'm down choking. the wrong pipe. Yep. Sorry. Okay. You're cool. I'll keep talking about Rocket threes and Diavels for a minute here. You can cough it out. I was laughing um, about a Mazda three. Anyway, yeah. The the Diavel. Uh, from Ducati is another sort of uh, power cruiser thing, smaller engine, but uh, but um, but also also a fun bike. And and uh, and I don't know how the wind protection would shake out on those machines, but you are sort of like you sit down in the bike a little bit more, um, and uh, and you wouldn't worry so much about uh, actual buffeting or or wind protection. You'd be sort of um, your helmet would be out in the breeze, I think. Which again, I think can sometimes actually make it a little bit more comfortable. I just worry. I worry that I don't. I mean, as a taller rider, I don't like sitting down in the bike. I'm more comfortable up on mm, top sure, of the sure. bike. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, it fair, comes down fair. to what Joe's is looking for. Like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Zach has has spent some time with my 890 Rally recently, and one of the reasons that I like that bike is that it's got a tall seat on it, so I feel like I'm sitting up a little bit taller. I don't have the bend in my knee. Um, and, and and based on Joe's 34 inch inseam, you know, maybe sitting for two hours while commuting to you know a client's you know office with a pretty aggressive bend in his knee might be uncomfortable for him. Okay, I got one last suggestion for Joe. It's a it's a it's a bit of a first six fifty. No, no, oh. I'm going 2015 to 20. Well, you don't even have to go that far back, but 20 whatever. You wouldn't be able to buy a new one, is the point. But KTM 1290 Super Duke. Then you're sticking with your KTM, uh, um, you know, ownership experience, which I hope I, I don't know, maybe you've liked, maybe you haven't, Joe. I'm not sure you didn't mention that in your in your bio, which is fair. The point is that bike I think is actually a little bit underrated as far as um, as far as comfort on a on a highway trip. You can get little um, fly screen fairings for it, like like um, 
like or windshields rather, like Spurgeon mentioned for his Bonneville, that'll take the wind off your chest. Um, it'll leave your helmet up in that clean air that I have been preaching about. It also has a factory luggage option, which I experimented with years ago that was surprisingly good. They're like, they're little kind of like, uh, they're small. <laughs> You're not, not going to be able to put so a helmet you, in it or anything like that. But Are you talking about the Super Duke or the Super Duke GT? I'm talking Super Duke. Uh, Super Duke GT is not a bad idea, though. That's where I'm going. Get You got okay, the bags okay. on it already. You got a little windscreen. Sure, and sure. If we're okay. going to go, go 1290 Super Duke GT, then why not uh, uh, a 1290 Adventure S? Because I think the wind protection is going to be a problem for him. I think it's going to be... He doesn't like adventure bikes. Yeah, doesn't like it. He struggled with adventure bike wind protection. Said that in the bio. So I think yep. we go away from adventure bikes. So I think Super Duke GT is not a bad idea. I like that. So for those of you listening, uh, th there are the, the versions that we're talking about. This KTM makes a 1290 engine, which is just a honking blast mm. of power and adrenaline. Thor's um, hammer. It's ridiculous. It's available in a naked sport bike, which is a Super Duke. It is available in a. Uh, naked-ish sport touring bike, which is the Super Duke GT, which adds in a little bit more of an upright position, a little bit mm. more of wind protection and some mm -hmm. luggage included. And then there's a 1290 uh, Super Adventure S, which mm -hmm. is essentially a more of an upright riding position similar to the 1090 uh, Adventure or the 1050 Adventure that he's on now, Joe. Yep. Uh, but it has different wheels, rims, electronics, and it's definitely more street commuting oriented. But all three of them have what Zach and I both consider uh, one of the more fun engines in the world of motorcycling today. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna land. I'm, I'm gonna stick it right there. I like. I don't think uh, I like that. The old uh, the the 1290 Super Duke GT. I think that would that that'll blow your hair back, Joe. Uh, it'll be a it'll be a big enough bike that it'll fit you okay. I think you might appreciate the wind protection being slightly less, but might, might even be a little bit more. Excuse me, comfortable for you, um, and and uh, and and yeah, you'd uh, I don't know you'll if you say you're spending two hours on the road to get to a client, you might even get there in an hour and a half. I'll tell you what, I you know I'm glad that you <laughs> recommended KTM, so I didn't have to. I can just go and agree with you. But I wasn't even thinking about that, if I'm being honest. And I think that given that uh, Joe is looking for something maybe a bit more comfortable, a bit easier to use, when you're thinking about like it's just easier to hop on, it's got a lower seat height to it. Um, it's got some some updated electronics and and some uh, technology that's going to make the bike quote unquote easier than his current model. Right. right. I, I think he should, uh, Joe. I think you should go find a 1290 Super Duke GT, maybe a couple years older, <laughs> um, for a test ride and see how you like it. And keep us posted, for gosh sake. All right, all right, Spurge. I think it might be time. Maybe your turn to introduce the next contestant on the motor dating game. Is that accurate? Oh, I can do it. I'm gonna <laughs> enjoy this a lot more than you seem to enjoy doing, Joe. Uh, for what it's worth. Well, so it's I'm gonna. Not that I don't enjoy it. I know, but you're, I'm, I'm, I, I want to hear more pizzazz in your voice. I know what you can do because you make fun of my name so often, and you do such a great <laughs> job of it that people are now writing in uh, using my name in 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 like all font, all caps quotes just based mm -hmm. on the way that you've said it. Anyway, <laughs> persona number three is Sarah. Sarah is 41 years old. Uh, she's 5'5", five, five, uh, weighs 145 pounds, 31 inch inseam. Uh, Sarah was very open and honest uh, with, with her, her size, and I appreciate that. Uh, bartender, Sarah's pastime. She once, this is a fun fact, once served drinks to an ex-president. Oh, ah. mm -hmm. okay. okay. Presidential. Uh, riding experience. <laughs> Sarah's been riding for 15 years. Uh, she started out on a Rebel 250 and eventually graduated to naked bikes, mid-size bikes. Uh, specifically, her current rider is a Z650 from Kawasaki, naked mm -hmm. parallel twin, for those of you that are not familiar. Uh, Sarah has some mechanical wrenching experience, oil changes, uh, chain swaps, wheel bearings, has a small garage behind her townhouse that she likes to, uh, she likes to spend time working on the weekends. She's looking to, oh, I'll save the budget. Her considerations, Sarah wants to try doing track days. She's afraid of crashing her bike. Um, yeah. so she, mm -hmm. she doesn't want to ride her regular street bike on the track. She wants to focus on track days to become a, a better street rider first and foremost, but also because the idea of just going fast and being able to get her knee on the ground intrigues Sarah. Fair enough. And uh, her uh, her budget, eight thousand dollars. Okie dokie. All right. So <clears throat> wants to get on the track. Wants to go fast. 
doesn't want to use her current street bike. Understandable all the way around. Um, I think I think it's I think you can't say versus or you can't say yeah, I was saying you can't say versus six fifty. <laughs> I could I could if I wanted to. You you, you can't say S V six fifty. Let's let's go let's go outside. <laughs> Why not? Of, What's wrong with an S V six fifty? A Suzuki S V six fifty is an excellent option. But I fear that we recommend it too much. So at the end of this, we could <laughs> okay. all we could all agree that a uh, that that for eight thousand dollars, Sarah could probably get a Suzuki SV650, which is a little V-twin engine. It it makes uh, about seventy horsepower. You can get them with front end swaps and top end suspension components that are perfect for a track day, easily you for under eight thousand dollars. You could probably find one that's already prepped for the track that already exactly. has like a bodywork on it. The lights are off. That yeah. it already has all the stuff. So we could end this right now and say SV650. <laughs> but I want us, I want us to raise the bar of this program a little bit, and I want us to, to have to use our brains and allow the the listeners um, to to witness, you know, as we try to turn these things on. Uh, in between our in our, our ears and our eyeballs, what do you think outside of an SV650 that Sarah should be looking at? Okay, I'm going to start with something that's also very basic and not that exciting, but but has to be brought up. It just has to. It has to. It has to. Uh, Ninja 400, mm. which is a, a, a small sport bike from Kawasaki, um, and uh, it is a, an oft recommended track bike because. They're good for the racetrack right out of the box. The the brakes are fine. The suspension's fine. Everything's good and sort of ready to go. And it's not like ultra high spec. But what you what you miss out on there is the sort of like um, you know the feeling, the fun feeling you can get when you uh, take a motorcycle to the track and just sort of like let it eat. You know, like let it stretch its legs. Like you can't even on a Z650 that Sarah has. Um, or any other sort of quote unquote mid sized bike, you know, if you're talking whatever, uh, a MT09 or a Triumph Street Triple or something like that, bikes like that, you can't just like hold them wide open for 10, 15, 20 seconds down a straightaway. You'd be going way too fast. And so that's one of the things that going to, going to a racetrack gives you is the ability to do that in a safe environment. And that's great. What you don't get from a Ninja 400 when you do that is much of a thrill because it's just not, it's a 40, four horsepower motorcycle. So it's just, you're not going to be going, you go hundred miles an hour, which is cool, but, um, but it's not going to feel fast compared to Sarah's Z650. However, last thing I want to say about the Ninja 400, that's very, very important is that the reason we, um, recommend it so much is that what you'll get better at riding a Ninja 400 is going through corners, right? You'll learn about lines and corner speed and leaning over and like carrying this, all this momentum around the racetrack instead of just using horsepower, which is very, very near and dear to my heart. That's how my um, motorcycle track riding uh, baptism happened was on low horsepower bikes. So I think that that's a, that's kind of like the way to do it. Well, it's interesting because I started out on on high horsepower bikes later on. Um, Mm -hmm. No, I mean my first track there was on the the Bonneville, but then I took California Superbike School and I got into, um, right? You know, they 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 stick you on an S one thousand RR, and then I worked backwards from there, and I kept kind of lowering my (laughs) displacement and lowering my displacement, and then eventually, right? You know, I was riding a Ninja four hundred around, and you're like, oh, I should have started on this because you. (laughs) Okay, so that was your experience. Was yeah, okay, yeah. You 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 learn how you learn that because you think. You think it's better for that reason? I think that with high horsepower bikes, the power allows you to just cheat your way out of situations. If you're in the wrong gear going into a corner or if you're not I carrying see. enough okay. speed, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can you can use the bike's power to to get yourself out of, of right. mistakes versus if you're in a Ninja 400 and you're not carrying enough speed because you braked too much because you, you, you are nervous and you're at the track for the first time and you're coming on the brakes way too early, you know, now you have to get that power back up and, and you're not going to mm-hmm. be able to. So I think, um, especially one of Sarah's considerations here is that while, you know, she wants to go to a track day, her focus at a track day is to become a better street rider. I think that that a Ninja 400 will very much allow for that to happen mm-hmm. um, because she's really going to have to learn about where her braking points are and, and where she needs to be carrying that that power and what gear she needs to be in. Like all that stuff starts to work together. Now, the downside to that is that you are definitely working a little bit harder on a Ninja 400. You definitely have to pay attention to things a little bit more because you can't. What do you, what do you mean by that? 
you have to make sure that you are in the right gear as you go into right. a breaking point. You you can't just leave it in third, plow into a corner, and then just <laughs> allow the the momentum of the engine to to pull you out of it. Like so, there's definitely more precision um, that you have to pay attention to, and there's definitely more considerations. Well, one thing I'd like to uh, a quick little kind of curveball that I'll throw in here is. One thing that I noticed when I raced uh, motorcycles for uh, you know in, in my in my younger years was that sometimes I would adapt to a slower motorcycle because of riding a faster motorcycle. So, for example, I would I would you know ride on the track on an XYZ 250, and then I would ride on the track on an XYZ 1000, and riding the the 1000, riding the riding a really fast bike on a racetrack. When I then went back to the slower motorcycle. Everything all of a sudden felt like uh, it felt like it was moving slower and felt like it was easier to comprehend. It was sort of like going into the batting cage and facing 80 mile an hour pitches and then going back to the 60 mile an hour batting cage and being like, oh, man, I'm just I'm so good at this because <laughs> everything's happening slower, you know. So I guess I would say I would put it to you, Spurgeon. Would would Sarah maybe not learn more? Or no, not learn more, but would she would she arguably not learn different things if she were to have a uh, a Suzuki GSX-R600 track bike, like a pure purebred sport bike track bike that has 100, 110 horsepower. And, you know, she goes ripping around the track and, and has that experience. And then when she goes back to the street on her Z650, she'll be like, oh man, this thing feels like it feels slow. It feels so like kind of just easy to use. And, and, and her, maybe her competencies would go up because of that. I like I, I like where your head's at. And that's kind of where my next pick is coming from. Now, I, okay. I didn't go... So when Zach talks about a GSXR um, 600 or 750, we're talking about you know full race clip-ons. We're talking about you know a purebred, fully fared Suzuki sport bike that is uh, arguably a well loved track weapon across <laughs> the globe at this point. My my problem is, I, I do think given Sarah's experience, um, I, I think a naked bike would probably be a little bit easier to adapt to. I, I, that's why okay. I liked your Ninja 400. It wasn't full on race talk. Right. I, I think one of the things that I still struggle with, and I'm a much larger rider than Sarah, is that like a full on sport bike for me, because I didn't grow up in that environment, even on a racetrack, it's, I feel cramped. It's harder for me to ride. Um, I, I much prefer going to the, the track with a, with a naked sport bike or something a little bit larger for my frame. So anyway, my point is, is that given Sarah's, um, love of of naked sport bikes i would i would think that for eight thousand dollars she could find a used um triumph street triple r probably not an rs um but that's <laughs> one of my favorite bikes to take to the racetrack it's still something where you know it's not full-on brute strength of the bigger the bigger 1050 engine that triumph has in the speed triple so you still have to um you know consider your lines a little bit and, and consider your, your gears and your braking points and you still have to work for it. Um, but at a hundred and something odd horsepower and upright seating position and you've got ABS and you've got traction control options. Um, I, I, I think that's a bike that is to be reckoned with and it's, it's comfortable enough to, you know, be familiar to Sarah, but it's also aggressive enough that it's going to be a bit of a departure from her current C650. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's, uh, that's not a bad idea. Something about having your track bike be sort of like more exotic mm -hmm. than your your daily rider, it, uh, like, you know, like uh, puts a question mark over my head. But I'm not well, saying you can't do it. You I, can I, absolutely I think, do that. I think I'm, the I'm just reason. Yeah, I think the reason that I was gravitating to it, I, I agree with you. She could always buy the street triple, use that on the street, and then take her 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 uh, Z650 to the racetrack. Um, but I think <laughs> the suspension and the electronics are a bit more sophisticated on the track. Ah, that's true. Okay, which fair enough. Yeah, I like arguably that. could make her introduction to the track a little bit easier than than a Z650. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I just did a quick Craigslist search and I found a 2014 Triumph Street Triple. Uh, Street Triple R, six, the six seven five version for five grand. So uh, there that'll you have probably it. that'll probably have ABS, but I don't think that that's going to have traction control. You know, you're right. I don't know if that has TC in that generation. Whatever. It doesn't matter. You'll be she's, fine. She's Sarah. riding a track bike. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, I would like to say whether it's a whether it's an older generation Street Triple for five thousand dollars or a Ninja four hundred that's like you know really prepped and set for the track for five thousand dollars, whatever. Sarah's budget was eight thousand dollars. I would recommend 
going under that budget. I would recommend shopping for five or six thousand bucks, Sarah, if you can, because you're gonna end up spending money on renting a trailer to get to the track, or uh, you know, perhaps I don't know if you already have a, a you know a set of leathers or you know two piece or one piece leathers to go to the racetrack, or specific uh, boots or gloves for track riding, or uh, an easy up to be at the track. You know, whatever. There's lots of stuff that you can bring to a track that makes your track day experience a little bit more comfortable and enjoyable that costs extra money. So I would I would I would ease away from that eight thousand dollar budget. I guess I don't know. I would also recommend coaching and or a track school Ooh, like if and, and this is something nice. that zach and That's i a recommend a lot yeah. Um, yeah, yeah but like sarah you know i mentioned you know when i really decided i wanted to go do a track day i i went and i signed up for california superbike school i didn't have a um i, I didn't have a bike of my own at the time I, I really wanted to try this i wanted to get better at it and there's varying schools out there you can look at yamaha champ school you can look at uh california superbike school where they have bikes that they can rent for you you can also go to your local track organization like um our, our local track organization here uh, at NJMP is Evolve GT is the one that I like the most. And they have little bikes you can rent. You can rent a Ninja 400. You can rent a, a Ninja 300. So mm -hmm. it, there might be some ways for you, Sarah, to try this out um, a, a little bit and use some of that budget to get into um, mm. the, the culture of track riding before you even invest in the motorcycle. Right, right. Fair enough. Well, I would transition to the next contestant on the motorcycle dating game, but I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, Spurgeon. I was going to ask you first if we wanted to round out Sarah's picks, even though we told her that oh, she should okay, go spend okay, money okay. on track. Is there is there a final <laughs> consensus of the bike for Sarah if she absolutely wants to know what bike to go get? Uh, probably an SE650, right? Isn't that what we should do here? I think we're coming back around. <laughs> find, find, I, find, find a good track prepped SV650, Sarah, and, and I think you're going to be very happy with that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good spot. Now, um, let's get in a word from our sponsor, Mo Tool, is what I think Zach was waiting for me to say. There it is. Well, we are back with uh, some extra personas for the motorcycle dating game. If you're just joining us randomly halfway through a podcast episode, you have no idea what you're in for. Uh, but for those of you that have been following along in normal sequential order, we are on to persona number four. And Zach, I think it's your turn to introduce Ty. Everybody, welcome Ty. Ty is 33 years old. Ty is four foot seven. Is that true? Is that real? Ty's is that a tiny a person. No, he's, oh. he's 32 okay, inch inseam though. Ty Long is legs. four foot seven, 195 pounds with a 32 inch inseam, <laughs> which is, I'm well. Anyway, that is, those are Ty's specifications. <laughs> Ty is a teacher. Um, um, while we're laughing with you, we're Ge laughing with you, Ty, not at you. That's yeah, yeah. No, I, I just the, those aren't um, those Normal aren't uh, specifications. Yeah, measurements that I was that I saw coming. But this is great. I'm, I'm we're looking forward to it. While living in Dubai, while, while living in Japan, Ty organized several motorcycle tours um, for parents renting bikes, uh, mapping the route, finding interesting sites. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, riding experience. Ty got uh, their license ten years ago, but only done. Uh, several multi-day trips on small capacity bikes, no regular riding or off-road experience, N and very little wrenching experience for Ty. Consideration for Ty's next machine, something that would be good as an all-rounder, uh, also good for commuting, comfortable and fun to take on a multi-day trip, and is economical. Uh, Ty has dreams of big adventures into the bush, but realistically wouldn't see anything more extreme than a dirt road. Um, and uh, asks us to remember that big bikes are usually tall and I'm a short guy. <laughs> okay, fair enough, Ty. Ty's budget is eight to $10,000. There you have it, everybody. Ty, persona number D. So I think it's, I think this is a good time to remind people, because um, I, I was looking at Ty's, I'm joking aside, I was looking at Ty's uh, measurements and Nicole is, I think, five foot one. My fiance Nicole is five foot one or five foot two, and she has a thirty-two inch inseam. So she's a shorter, she's a shorter yeah, but, individual, but, yeah, but she has longer she legs. I'm not, I'm not that dumb. <laughs> I'm not about to, I'm not about to say that on a podcast because so, Nicole listens to this, and I will get in trouble. Yeah, no, of course she does. Anyway, she she's three hundred forty so pounds. Five, one, she, <laughs> she's five one ish, and she, uh, you said thirty-one inch inseam. 31 to 32 inches seems somewhere around there. So my point is that copy, when copy, we copy. went motor when we went motorcycle shopping for her, um, we we had uh, more options than we originally thought based on how long her legs are, um, because she was able to touch the ground a little bit easier. So 
I think right. with ties, my well, point in saying all this ties a 32 inch inseam, which means that we're, we're not we're not working with like a 28 inch inseam. Got some got some long stems there, Ty. The point is, Ty, as Ty points out uh, or offers to us, is a shorter shorter rider. So that's a consideration in talking about Ty's next machine for an eight to ten thousand dollar budget. Um, and something that is a good all rounder, uh, economical, good for commuting, that kind of thing. What do you think? Versus 650? I would say a versus 650, we just move on. <laughs> yeah, maybe a versus 650 with a low seat to it. What uh, What about uh, versus X300? We love that bike. Yeah, but they're, 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 then you're getting tubes in the tires, and okay. he's already he's already made it clear he doesn't really care about regular off road riding. So like, mm, I'm just okay. not gonna yeah. I'm not gonna recommend something with tubes in the tires if they're not gonna use it off road. Like that just seems like wildly inconvenient given all the great options we have. Um, you get a BMW 310 GS. You know that's mag wheel. You know not not where my yeah. mind's going. Um, no, no. But uh, probably, probably still too tall, right? I mean, well, why, why, why bother if if the if there's not um, no, so you know, I, really I, a reason I'll, for it? I like the fact that Ty has done. He's been riding for ten years. Has done several multi-day trips on small capacity bikes under four hundred cc. So first of all, Ty, I like the cut of your jib. I like the fact <laughs> that you are out there doing long multi-day trips on small Agreed. displacement bikes. Agreed. That that makes me want to. I'm going to take a drink for you, Ty. Uh, just because that should be anybody nice. that's out there doing multi-day trips on small displacement, inappropriate sure. bikes. I raise my glass to you. Well, you didn't say it was inappropriate. I just said they were small displacement bikes. Which either I, way, but, but I think we we live in an age where I literally heard somebody the other day say that they couldn't put their their significant other on the back of a KTM 890 because. They it, it just didn't have, have enough power. power, and I'm like, that's insane. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Like, that bike makes a hundred horsepower. There's no way that you can't put somebody on the back of that and ride them around. Right. Um, that's true. So my okay, point so in saying that is like, yeah, let's try to yeah, help tie out yeah. instead of talking about yeah. Okay, so other what, what I would say others. is, um, let's look for something with with mag wheels. Let's look for something that maybe is slightly above 400 cc's. Gives Ty some creature comforts versus about, 650. <laughs> How about how about a Honda CB five hundred F? Or if that's too tall or 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 too something, what about Rebel five hundred? Honda Rebel five hundred, small, uh, five hundred cc, four hundred seventy one cc parallel twin, uh, solid little engine, and um, and uh, a cruiser, sort of like neoclassic cruiser looking thing. Pretty pretty good bike. You can get some like little factory luggage thingamajigs for it if you want to you can even get a little uh, windshield like you had on your bonnie and uh, nice low seat height good engine economical no you don't like it i just don't like the engine i mean the rebel 500 engine is just it's just so vanilla like i'd rather mm. i'd rather recommend a z400 at that point i mean a z400 at least has a little bit of pep in its step um if he does want to go down a dirt road, which he says that, you know, on his, his travels, there, there might be a dirt road in it. It's a little more upright seating position. You know, you can ride it down a dirt road if you wanted to, and you're not going to do any, any harm, really. Um, Are we sure that Ty's not five foot seven? Because if Ty was five <laughs> foot seven with a 32 inch inseam, that would also make sense. And they might also Producer, consider themselves sure. We're laughing. If you're listening to this on the podcast form and not watching on video, um, I'm, I'm, rubbing my eyes and, and my head is down and I'm laughing because as Zach's saying that, uh, Chase is, our producer Chase is literally set, handing me his phone with the actual email from Ty okay. I, I, where he, Ty, clar he clarifies. There's, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to question. It just, it feels like a, the four on the keyboard is right next to the five. And if you were five foot seven, you, you might also consider yourself a shorter rider and a 32 inch inseam. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Well, we're going to well, go with the 32 yeah, inch inseam. And our producer Chase's girlfriend is Snapchatting him photos. So I'm going to hand this back to you because that's popping <laughs> up on the screen and oh I don't. God. Okay. Yeah. So let's try to stay focused. So... <laughs> So you don't like the Rebel 500 because you don't like that that little Honda parallel twin, which is fair. It is it is kind of like it's it's a, it's a little bit of the Basset Hound of, of engines. It's kind of um, it's a little lopy. It's not, Ty, not wildly he, athletic. Ty's been riding for five years. I want to I want to allow him to get. I I he a little clearly bit of spice likes in Ty's life. Yeah, he that's clearly likes for. small displacement bikes. But why okay, not give okay. him something that's All a little right. bit spicier? Okay, okay. Uh, 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 what about what about a what about a Triumph? 
Speed Twin 900, formerly known as the Street Twin, the smaller. I um, have taken many trips on a Bonneville. <laughs> okay, oh my God. Yeah. I walked right into that one. <laughs> you do, you set I, yourself up <laughs> for that one. Because I for a, a street twin by any other name is a Triumph Bonneville, <laughs> Zach. And we all know that you can take all kinds of trips into the bush on a Bonneville. Okay. Uh, so yeah, what, you're right. You're speaking of the bush. What, what, <laughs> I, have dream, I have dreams of big adventures into the bush, but realistically wouldn't see anything more extreme than a dirt road. Ty okay. sounds like he's from Australia. So, the way he's talking about heading into the bush. Heading like into the bush. a crocodile on Japan. So perhaps yeah. the... Because yeah, we Pacific all know that Japan is only a hop, skip, and jump away from Australia. So I, I like what you're doing there. You're, yeah. Well, I don't know. He's a trap. Compared to, compared to Philadelphia, <laughs> right next door. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah. So, so it sounds like something with an adventure bent is, is something that Ty kind of. So maybe you'll have a pure street bike, like a Rebel 500 or a, or a, or a Triumph uh, Bonneville, is maybe not what Ty wants because. Because it doesn't work in his advent, in his vision of adventures into the quote unquote bush. Get a get a street scrambler nine hundred. You got some scramblery tires uh, on it. You can get some. You know, maybe. you throw some bags I in the back. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You're I'm, you're trying to I'm trying to work within your your boundaries here. You know. I mean, what? the street. Are you street twin? Um, there, there's that that retro kind of style option would be a nice little bump for him. You get a Himalayan. Okay, so, what about a Himalayan? Royal Enfield yeah. Himalayan. Okay. Okay, now you're talking. I don't, I don't I, hate I, that. I'm recommending that as a Zach Quartz recommendation. Spurgeon Dunbar would never recommend. <laughs> no, Himalayan. Spurgeon Dunbar no. would not. Um, hang on a sec. I'm just doing some seat height research here. Triumph Street Twin seat height, 30 inches. That's very reasonable. Very, very reasonable. reasonable. Two inches below Ty's claimed. Um, and the Street Twin, it, I think, is like 470 pounds. They definitely shaved weight off the Bonnevilles. It's like significantly lighter than the older 865 Bonnevilles. Mm. And I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not. No, I'm, 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 I'm cherry picking data very quickly here. But the Triumph T100, uh, which is the same engine and platform as a, a Street Twin or Speed Twin 900, uh, but has the more classic look, the two-tone uh, paint on the tank and the and the wire spoke wheels and that kind of thing. Uh, that bike technically has a higher seat height, according to this research. I'm yeah, doing it's, a, right it's now. a much bigger bike, and I don't think that that's no, that's, it that's no, it's the same. It's the same bike. Oh, it's I'm thinking. I'm, yeah, I'm thinking that. Sorry, folks. The T100 is the same engine as yes. the Street Twin. Yes. It's a 900 cc parallel twin. Yes. When you jump to the uh, the T120, T120, that's yes. when it gets up into the bigger 1200. Correct. My bad. Correct. My bad. Correct. But it is. But I think it's a taller. I do think it's a taller bike. A little bit. Yeah. The 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 Street Twin. Slash Speed Twin 900 is the one that is. Yeah, but also um, I, Ty doesn't want Ty doesn't want tubes in his tires. Ty's a you right, He you wants to that. he wants to take road you're trips. You're very certain of this. <laughs> he wants to take like, I, as someone that has gotten a flat tire on the Street Twin trip that I wrote. I wrote an article for Common Tread People, uh, the long way to Austin when I I wrote a, a Triumph Street Twin from um, uh, Triumph's headquarters down in Georgia to Austin, Texas for MotoGP, and I got a flat tire and it was very easy to plug. I pulled into a local Texas right. gas station. Okay. They had Fair a plug enough. kit and I fixed right. it. Well, the Himalayans got tube tires then. So the Himalayans the, out. The Himalayans out, according to Spurgeon Dunbar. Ty, I think a Himalayan is actually not a bad uh, bet because it's a it's a decent bike to ride on. If you want to take a weekend trip or something like that, it's like pretty. It's fairly comfortable. Seat foam is a little too soft, if you ask me. But anyway, it um it 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 works nice. It's got some wind protection. It's got some areas to strap some bags on there if you like. Um, it's fairly small and unintimidating. I think it's a 31 inch seat height or something like that, maybe 31 and a half. Uh, I think it would work out. Um, I saw a I, guy on a Himalayan the other day when I was leaving LA um, <laughs> yeah. and he was riding down the highway and he had two roto packs of fuel on that front crash front bar rack. rack of the Himalayan. <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool. So yeah, cool. Um, yeah I think if Ty, if Ty does want to venture a little bit further into the right. potential dirt road, then getting tubes in the his, bush. in his, in his wheels, um, will will help him get deeper, <laughs> uh, deeper in, if you will. Um, so I, I think that I think the the Himalayan could be a contender. I think the Street Twin could be a contender. Um, that brings back up. I mean, you could go versus three hundred, but at that point, the Himalayan's yeah, similar. Yeah. I mean, I know that we all when we, when you and Ari and I were talking about the best beginner bikes episode, the the versus three hundred X was one that we we all kind of yeah, liked. Hundred percent. Here's my here's my thing. Here's the thing that I, the reason that I'm going to go back to as I think we can round out Ty's uh, Ty's uh, contestantship. Can we not? Spurgeon? Yeah, versus anyway, six fifty. <laughs> exactly. 
I think uh, the reason I like the Speed Twin 900 or the or the Street Twin, same same diff, uh, is that it's a it's like a full sized bike. It, it's it's approachable because it has a relatively low seat height, um, and it is a mellow, calm engine. It's not going to like tear your arms off, but it is a full size motorcycle. It's like it the engine is 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 big and 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 like confidence inspiring i think to like chug down the highway it sounds good it looks good it it doesn't feel like you're riding a a i don't know like a like a beginner bike or a, or a or a sort of a starter bike or something sub 500 cc's you know like it really does have a similar demeanor to some bikes that have smaller engines but it it is a it is a really a full size bike and it would feel substantial in a way that i i for some reason i think Ty wants i have often said, and this is something that, you know, I was debating when we were going to the CTXP episode around beginner bikes, that like for larger riders, the the Street Twin is an excellent option for a beginner bike because it, it's approachable. It's not going to get away from you. There's just enough technology that it's going to, you know, give you ABS and some rudimentary traction control. Um, but in Ty's case, Ty's a, a bit of a shorter rider with a lot of experience. Yeah. He's been riding for right. 10 years. Right. Um, right. And I would say this, whether Ty gave us a typo <laughs> and he's truly five seven, or if Ty is four foot seven with a thirty two inch inseam, either way, I think a street twin would be an excellent option. I think that it's going to give him more power than any of the sub four hundred cc bikes that he's been riding for the past Correct. ten years. Yep. He's going to have fun on a road trip. He can get some throw over luggage for it without breaking the bank. He can get a little clip on windscreen for it if he wants to. Yep. But it's going to be it's going to be a step up. It's going to be a step forward in in his motorcycling experience and i i'm a big fan of that motorcycle as i've written about before (laughs) there you there you have it yeah yeah and i i i think that you know it's a good note to make actually spurge that um almost no matter what size rider you are that that not to be too intimidated by that by the size of that engine like the size of an of an engine in a motorcycle doesn't necessarily mean that it is is like raucous or powerful or anything like that my, my dad first rode his i my dad put my dad on a street twin a number of years ago when it sort of first came out from triumph and he was like 900 cc's well back in my day the, the 650 bonneville was the hottest thing on the block i don't know what i'm doing with a 900 they think it's a beginner motor, and then he rode it around and he was like oh this thing's a sweetheart it's, just, it's, it's so pleasant and <laughs> so oh, Jim. Um, yeah so i think uh i think that's a, a, a good thing to, to keep I- in mind there I will say that, um, so I mentioned this earlier, but I looked it up. So uh, Triumph, Triumph's claimed weight uh, on, on a Street Twin um, wet weight is around 475 pounds. So definitely lighter than what the older T100s um, were. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, And it is uh, new. You're looking at like right around $9,500 for an MSRP. Uh, ninety five, ninety six hundred bucks. Oh yeah, I forgot about bucks. the budget. What was the, what he was, was he was eight, eight, eight to oh, ten. Eight to thousand. ten. Okay, great. Well, then but, I'm right in the ball. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, but he says cheaper is fine, and I think that uh, right. I think that you can find a used street twin and and have a great time with it. So mm, indeed, good luck finding one that doesn't have header wrap and aftermarket pipes on it. But that's another podcast, isn't it? Uh, what uh, I think we got time for one more. Yes, Birch, let's do one more, at least. Let's do one more at least, because there's oh, there's okay. there's one more after that that you know. Oh yeah, that's right. You you yeah yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. But we'll see. We'll, we'll see where we're at. So well, talk us through the next uh, rider. Persona number five is Chris, thirty two years old, six foot one, two hundred and twenty nice. pounds with a thirty two inch inseam. That sounds like a correctly portioned individual. <laughs> Now, Chris is a senior application systems administrator. No idea what the f*** that means, Chris, but good for you. You got a job. Your parents must be proud. Chris, fun fact about Chris, was a mascot for the minor league hockey team for seven years. Go Swamp Rabbits. Ah, uh, Chris, you're really you're giving us a lot of information about yourself. Uh, Chris has been riding for nine years, mainly as a commuting and city rider with a few day trips in the mountains. Uh, from a mechanical experience, he has taken apart and put back together a Mazda RX-8 with upgraded parts. I believe that's a rotary engine too. Mm-hmm. Impressive, Chris. Your wankle. Yeah. Uh, however, no longer has a garage because he moved across the country and lives in an apartment in Colorado. So uh, Chris now lives outside Denver, uh, hashtag the mountains are calling, and uh, <laughs> he intends to really only, you know, 
take specific riding day trips for getting away for a weekend. Uh, Chris is a big guy, and I hate being bunched up and all hunched over. Likes technology, but doesn't uh, want so much technology that it mm. detracts from the riding experience. Mm. And was heavily considering an Indian FTR sport before uh, he moved out. But of course, then the scout and the chief uh, caught his eye. So, huh. okay. Look at look at the biggest budget we've seen so far. Chris is willing to spend around twenty thousand dollars, which is. Yew. It, well, I mean, we could we could give him a KTM 890 rally and call this a day. Well, that's what I was going to say. Mountains are calling. You got 20 grand to spend. 890 Scott, rally. Done yeah. deal. Just just put a stamp on that one and send it out. Just ship it. Well, so first thing I want to address about Chris here, uh, our senior application systems administrator, uh, is that Chris says that the mountains are calling, but then says... Uh, of course, the Indian scout and the Indian chief have caught his eye. So perhaps in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way that the mountains are calling, Chris, it is not necessarily a, an adventurous or, or a, a dirt road or trail call, but rather a twisty road, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a paved exploration kind of call to the mountains, right? Because he's talking about an Indian scout, which is a, a sort of 1,000cc cruiser. Yep, 1,200cc cruiser. There's two of them, I think. Whatever, it doesn't matter. And then the Chief, which is the larger, even the bigger engine uh, cruiser from from Indian. Um, yeah, I, having just come back from a PTO vacation to the right. lovely, I was going to say the windy city, but that's Chicago, the mile <laughs> high city of, uh, of Denver, um, I was out there for a concert at Red Rocks with Nicole, and we actually uh, we had a, a couple extra days on the back end, and we took a bunch of hiking trips. And one of the roads that connects Morrison, Colorado, to Evergreen um, was one of the most winding, spectacular roads mm -hmm. that I was ever on. And nice. we actually used it to get to a hiking trail. But as we were getting the hiking trail, like it was just motorcycle after motorcycle after motorcycle. Nice cruisers, sport bikes, adventure bikes, pretty much everything. So. I think from that perspective, I agree with you. I think Chris is looking for something that is um, maybe a bit American V-twin inspired uh, uh -huh. and is probably looking for curvy mountain roads, not necessarily um, not necessarily adventure bikes. So I'm going to take the 890 rally off the table. <laughs> oh, that was probably hard for you to say. It was, but Sally wasn't for sale anyway. We'd have to find you your own, Chris, and frankly, they're <laughs> hard to come by. Um, <laughs> what do you think, Zach? If you had $20,000, you want to cut and curve and cruise some mountain roads. I, I, I think it's hard because <sighs> it seems like Chris is going for something a bit, uh, a bit more... Uh, cruiser inspired with this right, and my right. gut reaction is like naked sport bike or something yeah. more adventure sport touring but an ftr sport with the 17 inch wheels would be a yeah. hell of a bike for yeah. chris to curve mountain roads on true 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 uh curve carve i think i should be saying carve carve yeah, mountain roads. On. perhaps Who? chris curves the mountain roads we don't know chris yeah. that well i think that the ftr is a great bike i think it might be my my instinct is that it's a little too rowdy for chris um it's like it's it's a i don't know it, it's a it's a it is a nice bike and it does look cool and it does work pretty well um but it's it's kind of uh like cruising along and taking it easy isn't really what that bike likes to do in my experience and if memory chris serves, was a mazda rx8 driver you oh, think that's true. He, you think he okay. just wants? I mean, that's kind of a sporty, peppy little car. That's a sporty, peppy little car. Uh, one thing I'll say about the FTR. Let me see if my memory serves here. Indian FTR uh, fuel capacity and therefore range: three point five gallons, one hundred and twenty miles for range. At at best, I, I when think. I when I rode the original FTR, we got to test ride the very first one that was brought into the country. And I remember uh, Joe Zito was with me at the time, and we ran it out of gas. Like, we rode it down the highway. <laughs> he followed behind me in a truck, and we rode it out of gas. And I, I'd have to go back to my article, but I don't think the range is more than, like, 120 or 130 miles. No. I just looked it up, and that, and that was a long time ago that you did. That was the original FTR. There's a new one now. And I think the uh, – I just looked it up. It says 3.4 gallons. And, I mean, you know, so if you're, even if you, you know, you're going to get – 
40 miles a gallon or something like that. If you're lucky. So not, not that a was, that's, I, a, I just, that's a big honking V-twin that's sucking down gasoline. <laughs> it's a thirsty girl. I don't remember exactly what uh, my fuel figures were. I'd have to spend more time looking that up. But the point is, for some reason, I don't think the FTR is is the bike is the bike for Chris. What else, what else is like, is, uh, is V, well, I mean, like you, you recommended a street glide before. Why not a street glide for Chris? A uh, street glide for Chris could work. Um, I'm trying to think of what's the other one. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, of American V twin, you know, machines that, that, um, Oh, the Harley Davidson di- Bronx. Oh, wait, <laughs> right, right, wait, right, right. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. That's not out yet. Harley <laughs> Davidson. Oh, nice. I like how what you about said a- yet. What about a Pan America? That I was that's what I was gonna say. Pan America, uh, good sport touring bike, good uh, uh, you know big V twin character, uh, hundred and fifty you know, odd peppy horsepower, quite peppy, uh, pretty comfortable. Um, you can get it with adaptive ride height. Chris has a thirty two inch inseam, which so means Chris, that Chris he might, might want to yeah. Well, no, thirty two inch inseam on a taller adventure bike. Maybe Chris does want that. Maybe because maybe, he's gravitating maybe. towards. Chiefs and Scouts, which true. have a lower seat height. Maybe he's more true, true. comfortable with both feet on his ground. Okay, yeah. okay, all right. For those well, of Pan-America, you, for those of you that don't understand what Zach and I are arguing about, the Harley <laughs> Davidson Pan America uh, has an option for adaptive ride height. So when you come to a stop, the bike actually lowers down, so you can get your feet comfortably on the ground. And it's like it lowers down like a twenty-eight or a twenty-nine inch inseam seat height. It's pretty impressive. Mm. So uh, that I, that's that's something that I that I uh, that I. I can I can get along I can get on I suppose I can get on that. I'm trying to think of cruisers that handle curves particularly well, and I can't help but go back to, um, uh, uh, uh the like Ducati Diavel, for example, which Tri- Triumph Rocket Three, Triumph Rocket Three. Would you prefer the Rocket Three to the Diavel? I only rode a Diavel once, and it was not the new one. I would I would I would have to ride the new. The new one to kind of get a sense right. of okay. Yeah. Well, even if you don't get a new like a v- Diablo V4, which is the new one, if you if you got a, a 1260 or 1200 or something like that, that's a bike that's like it's a uh, it's 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 got to be sp- it's got to be sportier than the Rocket Three, right? Yeah, it's lighter and yeah. it, and it just like I think it just turns better. It's like it's actually a, a quite a quite a sporty and fun bike to whip through a set of curves, and uh, and it does not have the the necessarily the classic sort of feet forward cruiser riding position that you might find with an Indian scout or an Indian chief, which you mentioned, mentioned Chris. So I think that's something, however, it is a lowish seat height and, and the mid controls mean that your, your knees will be cramped up a little bit, much more so than they would be on a, say a Harley Davidson Pan American, uh, sorry, Pan America or, um, or, you know, another sort of adventure style bike. And I like did, the did Chris mentioned something about, um, Oh, I, I I like technology, but I don't want so much that distracts from the riding experience. Okay, yeah. So the Apple might be like, a little bit heavy. I mean, well, and I mean the Pan yeah, America is a little bit a little bit heavy on technology too. Yeah, it's a big bike. It's a big bike, sure. No, no, I said um, heavy on technology, not heavy. But oh, like, heavy on technology. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. sure. Absolutely, it's also heavy on technology. It is figuratively heavy and literally heavy. Um, well, I don't know. What, I, what are I, we I not picking that, up here, Spurge? I I keep coming back to what he threw out here as an FTR sport, a, a scout, a, a chief. You know, my uh-huh. only problem when we did when I did the the, the ride, we did a across Pen, cr- Pennsylvania road trip video when we were riding the the I think it was a super chief, and it just it it put me in an uncomfortable riding position as a yes. larger rider. Yes, yes. Um, and that was my that was my problem with that. The same thing with the scout. Uh, I think the Scout is an amazing engine. I, I wish Indian would take that and put that in something a little bit more upright. But then I guess that's really what the FTR kind of is. Um, yeah, yeah. So that gets back to the FTR Sport. I, I'm just. I what just, about? I got. I got something for you. I got something for you. Triumph. Uh, uh, is it Bonneville? The the Bobber. Uh, but it, for I guess if he's just doing like a weekend a weekend road trip. But there's no, I mean, the, does he, does the he want to do road trips. Did he say that? I, like weekend, weekend, getting away for the weekend. Uh, right? Getting like, away for the weekend. Okay. The, yeah, the problem with the bobber, for those of you um, that aren't familiar, Triumph built a, a, a bobber essentially um, on their 1200 <laughs> platform, and then but they it called was, it a bobber. Yes, but it was essentially just a single seat, um, not really a place for luggage. I guess he could do the. Um, they brought the was it the Sportmaster? 
there's the Speedmaster. Speedmaster, Speedmaster. That's back, and that's mm. on the bobber platform, but with okay. the passenger seat and then accommodations right. for, you know, okay. you, could, you could get some luggage there for a weekend trip. I just think the bobber looks so cool, and it's and it's sort of you get sort of like you get a you get some sort of like uh, you get it looks well, it's not cool. V twin. It's a parallel twin power, but you get, it sounds cool. It looks cool, and it's like it's fun handles, to ride. Handles better, well. yeah, handles better yeah. than. Uh, some of the, so back to Harley Davidson. Also, there's that um, you got that low rider ST. Remember that they came out with that with the bags uh, on it. Yep. yep. Last year it's got bags on it. It's got the little fairing. I got a buddy who's six foot three and has one, and he he says it's comfortable. <laughs> um, so you know that's something you could consider there, Chris. But I, I I don't know. I I can't help if you want to be if you want to be stretched not stretched out. If you want to have lots of room on the bike when you're sitting on it. I just don't think that there's a way you can avoid talking about ADV bikes, whether it's a, a sort of a more road oriented ADV bike, like a, um, I don't know, say a Versa 650 or, uh, but seriously, a, a Harley, you know, Pan America. Um, what about a Honda VFR 800? I feel like we haven't brought that <laughs> back up. Wow. Well, that's true. Bottom line here, Chris, the good news is you're not going to need to spend 20 grand to get the, the bike that you need, you know? I, I, I've got an idea, Spurge. Actually, I just had another idea for a bike. People barely ever talk. I'm about on the this edge bike. of my seat, people. What you sure. can't see you, is right now. You I'm never. about to fall off. <laughs> I don't even know how many of them they sell. Probably not that many. They're kind of rare. No one ever talks about them. They're not that popular. But what about a BMW GS? Mmm. Mmm. Like a hen's tooth. Like a like a, a needle <laughs> in a haystack. Where would you find one of those? I I I like the BMW GS. Because it's, you know, one of the things that I'm sensing from Chris is that he does like, he likes, he's looking for a twin, right? He's looking for that, that quirky kind of a, of a, sure. not, he's not looking for the smooth, the precision and uh, that, that boxer twin that's in the GS is so charming in its own quirky way. I think that would give him something very similar to what he's trying to get with an FTR sport or something like that. But I just have a feeling, I, my heart of hearts, and, and Chris didn't say this outright, is I just don't think Chris is looking for an adventure-style motorcycle. I like the idea right. of a Pan America. I like the idea of a GS. I think from a practicality standpoint, he'd probably love it. I mm -hmm. just don't think that's what Chris is looking for. And we talked okay. about this when we were doing the yeah. beginner episode. Like, we all buy bikes especially when we're starting off because we want to look we want to go out in the garage and look at them you know and right. i know chris doesn't have a garage excited. he has an apartment but you want to go look at this thing sure, sure um i i think i i liked your idea of a diablo i'm coming around to that i think it might be too much technology for chris it might okay. be too much on the on the technology side i like your idea of the the lowrider st i think that mm -hmm. gives chris some options and I don't know. I think that that FTR Sport. Yeah. If, yeah, if, yeah. If, if, if I had to choose out of the bikes that Chris had listed and some of the bikes that we talked about, and he's looking at just doing some weekend rides and some curvy roads, I would probably be between the the Harley Davidson Lowrider ST if he wanted something more truly uh, American V twin cruiser inspired, sure. or the right. Indian FTR Sport. If he was looking for more of a, a naked sport bike experience with uh, an American V twin pedigree, that's a great summary. I, I've, I've got no notes there. Okay, I think I think you summed it up. All right, Chris. Well, hopefully we, have, we solved your problem for you. Do we have time for one more? Uh, You're in charge here. We got time for one more. We're gonna make okay, we're gonna make Dave our last one, but it's gonna be quick. Okay. So because I trust that you'll be able to give the synopsis on Dave faster than I will. <laughs> um, because of my charismatic flair, why don't you right. go ahead and tell us who the final persona is for the dating game, High Side, Low Side, Season 7. Final contestant on the dating game, Round 2, Season 7 of High Side, Low Side is Dave. Come on down, Dave. Dave is 44 years old, 5'8", 190 pounds with a 30-inch inseam. Dave is an IT infrastructure business analyst, which sounds very complicated and lucrative. Fun fact about Dave, Dave has two chihuahuas. Uh, that each weigh less than six pounds. There we you picked, go. We picked and, Dave for you, Lance Oliver. For those of you not <laughs> listening that don't realize that Lance Oliver is a Chihuahua aficionado. <laughs> Connoisseur, even. <laughs> yeah. Another fun fact, Dave also plays drums in a jazz trio. Yes. Uh, Giddy-dee-dee-dat-dee-doo. 
That's <laughs> excellent, Dave. Um, Dave has 10 years of riding experience, but less than a year of wrenching experience. Considerations for Dave's next bike, a good starter bike to wrench on for someone with little to no experience, something that I can use to learn to wrench and make mistakes on that is not my daily rider. Dave's budget for his um, Frankenstein project that he will rip apart to the screams of mechanics everywhere, 5,000 US dollars. Dave, speaking from experience, uh, and the fact that there is one of my chassis uh, sitting behind me that has been uh, yes. uh, not completed for the past decade, <laughs> and it's hard to say that, but like I was thinking about this the other day, like it's been a freaking decade. Like I bought that bike when I was in Nashville. I've been in Philly for ten years now. Um, buy a bike that runs. Like I, I get mm. that you wanna you wanna um, have something to practice wrenching on, and you don't want it to be your daily rider. If you get a bike that already runs and then you start tinkering and tweaking and adjusting, um, you're going to be in a much better starting point as somebody with minimal wrenching experience that wants to learn how to wrench. Because you're not trying to get the bike running. You're not trying to figure out mystery gremlins. You have a bike that runs and then you're just making tweaks. You're learning how to tune carburetors. You're learning how to you know, change oil. You're learning how to change wheel bearings or chains or sprockets, things like that, um, versus buying a bike that's a basket case that doesn't run and then trying to put it back together without any real experience on, on how to do so. And that's, that's my two cents as we start thinking about what bike is right for Dave. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I was just trying to look up... Um uh, I was just trying to look up a, a, a article, an article that Ari wrote years ago. I can't, I can't find it right now. But he had a great line, uh, and I'm going to misquote it. But it was something to the effect of, um, you know, the 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 dreams of creating a cafe racer, or or, uh, or the the road to cafe racer stardom is, or the side of the road is littered with projects that are half built, basically something like that. Um, and it's totally true. You know, it's so easy to be like, Oh, I'm just gonna do this thing. It's going to be awesome. Um, so I like your advice very much, Spurge, to, to get something that, um, that, uh, that sort of like runs and put around. And I think that the simpler, the better, because then mistakes that you make will be easier to fix. And you'll also be less intimidated to dive into things and, and, um, and try to improve them. And right. if you I mean, don't want to take if you don't want to take our advice, Dave, and you want a half baked <laughs> basket case, shoot an email to highside low side at revzilla.com <laughs> and I have got a deal for you, my friend. And I will send you an old Kawasaki that yeah. no one even recognizes. You anymore. send me a check for three thousand uh, dollars. No, your limit was five thousand dollars. You send me a uh, check for five thousand U.S. dollars. I'll send you a couple of egg crates full of uh, motorcycle parts and a and a frame. And you go to nice. you go you go to town, bud. <laughs> but seriously, so, what, what 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 would be the starting point for you? I'm thinking I'm thinking Japanese, uh, sure. based on ja parts availability yes. and ease of ease of putting back together. I'm also thinking air cooled. Yeah. That's just my kind of like yeah. uh, an air cooled engine. So there's no radiator, there's no coolant going in and out of it. It's just sort of like an easier thing to dive into. It's going to be less complex to. Um, to, to yeah to, to mess around with um so what about cb350 I mean, yeah i was gonna say cb350 but like do you really want to go back to the 70s do you really want a bike that has like crappy brakes and that kind of thing because you can get something that's newer that's still air cooled and still sort of like relevant in in the in the conversation of modern motorcycles even if it's an antiquated design you know like what about a what about a um Versus, you know, like an older, versus 650? <laughs> yeah. Versus 650 is liquid cool, though, have you know. Oh. Um, what about a KLR 650 or a, or mm. a Honda XR 650? Um, or like, you know, a, a, sort of a, a dual sport that is a that is a long-running um, style of motorcycle, so parts will be easy to find, um, and it'll be, uh, I don't know, yeah, it'll be sort of like easy to find forum posts and manuals and upgrade lists and that kind of thing. Dave plays drums in a jazz trio. Oh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, he's not what looking you... for easy, man. He's looking for <laughs> he wants he wants a little bit complex, a little bit left to center. You know, sure. sure, okay, okay, fair enough. He's mysterious. Um, he and his chihuahuas are at home. <laughs> you know, jazzing up. No, I, I think I think KLR six fifty. Joking aside, KLR six fifty is a great point. Um, 
the, the, the bike that is behind me uh, started life out as a, uh, a Kawasaki <laughs> LTD 440. Stop um, talking about your project, Spurge. Nobody no, cares. But my, but my point is it's small okay. parallel twin, easy to find parts for. Uh, people build little kits for it. Um, th th so it's it's an 80s option uh, for a little parallel twin that I think uh, <laughs> could be something that he could consider if he's looking for like a little cruiser project. Um, and you can get it for like, I bought this one for 75 bucks. So like they're they're out there. You can find them for cheap. I feel like what would Andy Greaser recommend if Andy Greaser was here oh. right now? Good question. Good question. Something esoteric. Oh, hey, I I know. Well, this is this is very much my. I don't know how I didn't bring this up before. This is very much my roots. But, Scooter. But <laughs> no, uh, uh, an air cooled uh, BMW from hmm. anywhere from 1972 to 1990. No, 1988. Whatever. I don't know. There's like a long swath of airhead BMWs. You're talking your R75 slash fives. Your R80. STs, R80GSs, R90 slash sixes, or whatever, all, all that kind of stuff. Those bikes are um, pretty simple, um, realistically. It's it's their their two valve head, um, uh, you know, single spark plug that, and their boxers. So the engine stick out the side of the, or sorry, the cylinders stick out the side of the engine, which makes getting to the valve train very easy. It makes getting to you know exhaust. Um, uh, flanges and carburetors very very easy um they're there and it's a it's a single plate dry clutch in there which is like a good thing and a bad thing but ultimately is it it's sort of an antiquated like old style design but uh it is a it is a very very um sensible bike to start spinning wrenches on in my opinion however i will say it goes against what i said before about like why get a bike with crummy brakes and that kind of thing because you're gonna just, you know I'm just Stuff's afraid gonna that you're not going to be able out. to find one in good condition to work on for five thousand dollars. I feel like oh, some of those bikes are. My daddy, oh, he's got some sitting around the garage that'll be perfect. <laughs> wait, wait, for wait! You. It, Here, I've already, I have already got Dave on the hook to buy a Kawasaki 440. Don't bring, Dave don't bring want him into this. Kawasaki 440. Nobody, he doesn't nobody want, cares he doesn't want your dad's sidecar laden project BMW hanging out in the yeah. shed in Vermont. Project. Mine has been First mine all, has been mine has been studio stored for the past ten years. <laughs> that it has. It's also been meticulously disassembled and then <laughs> not put back together. Remember Spurgeon's first piece of advice was get something that runs. Don't listen to him, Dave. Also, how cool will all your jazz friends think when you turn up on a vintage German, you know, BMW? That'd be really cool. Mm. They're really cool bikes, and there's tons of. I mean, there's just like tons of parts for them. There's tons of like custom builds if that's what you want to do eventually. But if you just want to like tinker around, and to get back to Andy Greaser, that's what his most recent purchase was. I mean, as far as I know, I don't know. He bought that um, that BMW recently for much less than five thousand dollars, and uh, he bought it out of been... a flood. That bike was under twelve feet of water, and he like rebuilt the whole thing. I'm not recommending that for Dave. Don't go no, buy no, a flood not, victim. Not. Yeah. The point is, five thousand dollars is plenty to get an old Airhead BMW. What about a Honda Hawk? Eh. D twin too hard to work on. Eh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. A little little too esoteric for okay. me. Okay, okay, okay. What about yeah. probably harder to like this one? one. I think you're gonna like this, Spurge. I just did a search in Craigslist with a max price of five thousand dollars, and VFR the only two words I used was no was Triumph Bonneville. Mm. So mm. what about an old Bonnie, like an old mid two thousands or late two thousands Bonnie, air cooled? Um, not a hugely complex engine. Uh, undeniably cool. To be, to be cool. clear, to be clear, uh, when Zach and I say old, we are not we, like this is really when you're talking about Triumphs. That's true. You have to be careful. Yeah, I said mid two thousands. No, no, you did, you did. But okay. like, if you're if you're doing a search and you're like, oh, cool, I found one in the mid two thousands, but then I also found one in like nineteen seventy eight. I'm going to work on that one. Don't. It completely different. Completely different. <laughs> and I and yes. I like your recommendation. Like joking aside. Part of the reason that I really like the Bonneville, part of the reason that I have 80,000 miles on it, part of the reason it's still in my garage is because it was the bike that I learned how to work on. I did my first fork disassembly on that bike. I installed shocks for the first time. I put a center stand on it. I replaced nice. the, yeah. the, CD, the, the CDI box and the, and the pickup coil, and I put a clutch in it for the first time. Like There was so much on that bike that I just learned how to do myself. Um, right. And I think that that is a great option. And yeah, if you can okay. find it for under five thousand dollars, they're wildly dependable. Um, at least in my experience. I mean, I, I think the first major repair was a clutch at like fifty-five thousand miles or something like that. So, 
Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, I think that's a, that's a pretty good. And and to Spurgeon's point, so I searched for Triumph Bonneville less than five thousand dollars on Craigslist. The first two hits, or one was a two thousand nine Triumph Bonneville T one hundred that's got some like mods on it and stuff, but like looks, you know, it's cool, cool looking bike, forty nine hundred bucks or five grand, I guess. And then another one was a twenty fourteen Bonneville with cast wheels. Um, and uh, it looks like it's in mild disrepair, but like it seems like it needs tires, and that's pretty much it. Forty five hundred bucks, so that's not not a bad idea. Just below that, I found a nineteen seventy three Triumph Bonneville seven fifty for three thousand dollars. Awfully, awfully handsome bike. But to Spurgeon's point, do not start your mechanical adventure with a nineteen seventies British motorcycle. That's uh, not. I would. Uh, I would argue. I, I, I would argue, Dave, if you're if you're considering this, and we got to we'll, we'll wrap it up with this. If you're looking at a modern era Bonneville. 2000 and I want to say 2001, 2002, 2001, 2002 to like 2007, 2008. Um, and the reason Those for that is when you, ones? yeah, when you get to tw- when you get to 2009, you get into fuel injection. It changes a little right. bit. Um, true, true, fair enough. I, I think I, I learned how to work on carburetors because I had to put new jets in the carburetors when I put a new exhaust on. Like there's just more for you to learn on a Bonneville. Um, that is still the the carbureted version. It's a little bit different. Lemmy used to make fun of me because I talked about that all the time, but like there was just something (laughs) a bit more classic to it. And it just gave you, especially if you're looking to wrench, Dave, um, maybe you have to replace the the boots because they're worn out. Maybe you need to rejet it. Maybe you're going to put an exhaust on it and you want to play around with that. Like um, there's just so much to explore, but I believe it's 2001 to 2008 uh, was the the run for carburetor. And you could also look at a Thruxton. You could look at a, a Scrambler. You could mm-hmm, look at a sure. Bonneville or a T100. Um, I do think the 865 engine, for a couple of years, they had a 790 engine. I think the 865 is probably a little bit uh, of where I would be looking. Um, yeah, just more as a fun road. fact, yep. Dave. Yeah. But that's, that, okay. I, I, well, that, that's the, I, I'm glad that you said it. So uh, early. But I, I think that's a great pick. Early to mid two thousands, uh, uh, Triumph Bonneville. Just to, 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 to so, I just really quick. Versus it's 650? fair to mention, uh, like a like a Harley Sportster uh, uh, of of some time in anywhere from three years ago to twenty years ago, right? Then it's sort of like mid two thousands or late two thousands or absolutely a Sportster eighty three or a Sportster twelve hundred. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. Eighty three iron or a Sportster twelve hundred. Those are Ton those are parts. also like. Lots of parts, of parts, lots of stuff to do. Uh, uh, lots of lots Pat, of Pat, our Patrick Garvin, who we have on the podcast <laughs> often. Uh, he's over uh, on the J and P side of things, but like he can he can show you one hundred and twenty thousand mods <laughs> um, that you could do with a, a solid Sportster chassis. I think that's mm-hmm. another great recommendation. Um, I liked your recommendation earlier of a of a KLR six fifty. So let's leave it at this for you, Dave. If you want something a bit more like for fighting off zombies and surviving the apocalypse, check out a KLR 650. <laughs> uh, find one of the early ones from the 90s where you've got a purple frame on it and it looks crazy and cool. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, go crazy with tell your heart's content with mods. Look at a 20, 2001 to 2008 Triumph Bonneville um, with the 865 engine or look at any... Um, Harley Davidson 883 or 1200 Sportster. If you're looking for something a bit a more American V-twin, and you could do some really crazy and, mods with those. And if you if you have a mustache that you that you wax and uh, and you roll your own cigarettes, then perhaps that uh, air cooled BMW. He's in a jazz trio. I think right. we all know that he's smoking jazz cigarettes whilst rolling <laughs> okay. his mustache in in wax. <laughs> We're so, getting into like a World War II era. He's got a little goatee uh, on there. He's got a little uh, Van Dyke. And commercial he's, for cigarettes here. Yeah. Mm. Four out of five doctors recommend camels. Jazz cigarettes are not regular <laughs> cigarettes. And that just shows that you don't know what I'm talking about. But maybe listeners out there. Who out there can explain to Zach what a jazz cigarette is? We'll leave it there, folks, uh, for our personas. But we are still going to play the engine sound guessing game. Um, yeah. and just the two of us this time, Just Birch. the two of us. Uh, amigo versus uh, amigo here as we go into this <laughs> spy versus spy if you will uh, are you ready to play your engine for those of you listening uh, Zach and I uh, incorporate into every episode starting in season 7 an engine sound guessing game we hope that you at home are playing along with us we are going to play the sound of the uh, of the engine um, we are then going to give each other a few hints Zach and I do not know what the engine is um, but yeah, our producer, do Chase, not. does. And he's sitting right here with the answer. 
But before we do that, let's all take a second to listen to the sound. goodness i i think i i i i'm i'm having fun with the engine sound guessing game and i so appreciate you all donating your time and putting all the effort into sending in clips of your motorcycles running can we work on audio quality just a little bit just i just i just want to i just want to try raise the bar just a little bit so that so that we can hear a little better and and you know not not put the the uh, the 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 recording device too close to the exhaust so that it gets blown out for example. What is the start? So that's a great PSA. What is <laughs> what is the sound at the beginning? The fuel pump running. No, like listen below the fuel pump running. It's almost like it's almost like it sounds like there's like an engine or something. I, it's just weird. The ticking. Yeah. Hmm. What's the ticking? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we it's it's amazing our ability to create a game that we are so poor at. It's a game that we can't win. But maybe the audience out there is screaming their answer at us, um, and they knew beforehand. So I think I'm gonna, the blinker's on. I think whoever turned oh, this in, they left the blinker on. That's it, they, it's a it's a uh, the solenoid. They're uh, trying to distract us with the blinker. Yeah, the the blinker relay, not a solenoid. The relay. Um, okay, I'm going to throw a hint out. If, if you feel that you know what the sound is, not you, Zach, but you, the proverbial audience, um, and you get it right before I give any hints, throw us an email to highsidelowsidelrevzola.com. Tell us that you say, beat us. It's got two cylinders. I know, I know It's that. got two cylinders, easily. Yeah. Okay. Yep. But, I, but, so, I, but aside from that, I have, I have to say I'm struggling. There's two cylinders. Uh, well, thanks for this first hint, Chase. You really knocked it out of the park. Uh, liquid cooled American V twin. Thank you for narrowing it down for us. Uh, Zach and I already knew that. Um, <laughs> Wait, it's a, it said liquid cooled American. It's a liquid. It's liquid cooled American V twin. So we knew it was a twin. Okay. I did. I didn't necessarily so, know it was liquid cooled, but no, nor did I. Although it sounds pretty pretty peppy to be an air cooled engine. It sounds like it's got kind of a kind of a high performance bent and a, and a light flywheel for for air cooling. So that doesn't surprise me. But liquid cooled American V twin doesn't leave a whole lot of options indian scout right could, i'm could thinking that. I, i'm thinking of something that's more raucous and i mean it could be it could be a modern it could be a modern harley or indian um plant i mean pan america it, it just sounds it sounds i mean the pan america is peppy but I think it's got so you have to get some aftermarket uh, exhaust on there too. You agree? Oh yeah, that's not yeah. stock. <laughs> that's not stock. I think Indian Scout's a good guess. I think what like what what else is there? What other liquid cooled American? One V-twin. last time for the audience. Let's just take okay. one quick listen. Good. I like it. If we find out that this is the bike that Patrick built, this is the <laughs> the Fat Billy uh, Milwaukee Eight build that he did. I'm gonna feel really I'm gonna feel really silly. This feels, might feels, this might be that. It might be the Milwaukee Eight build. Really, that Patrick yeah. did. It sounds it sounds too flywheel sounds too light for for uh, Milwaukee Eight. But I'm, I'm honestly I'm I'm pretty stumped. I I guess I I mean like Indian Indian Scout is my. Uh, Scout bobber. That's my guess. I don't know. I got no, I got nothing. Same engine as it doesn't matter whether it's a bobber or not. All right. Let's What's the next hint, try Birch? hint number two. Has a tubular steel twin spar frame. Tubular steel twin spar. Is that FTR? It's not a scout, in other words, because the scout's a cast aluminum frame, I think. Yeah. 
Does FTR does FTR have a tube frame? I think it does. I think it does. I'm I'm I'm, okay. I'm trying not to cheat and go to Google. Um, <laughs> now, if we're going to cheat, I, we might as well just get the last hint. Is there one more hint, or did it just tell us at this point? No, we just have the answer at this point. I, okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll gonna, just go FTR then. I don't know what 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 uh, what a liquid cool is it? A, it could be a V rod. Could it be a V rod. Maybe. Whatever. All right. Answer. What what do we got? It was an FTR. It was a okay. 2019 Indian FTR 1200S. So you and I were, were both on the right track here. I'll, I'll mm-hmm. give us both bonus points for this. Uh, <laughs> Sean, thank you for sending this in. It does have a S&S 2 into 2 Grand National High Pipe on there. So that's nice. that that's raucous what you're sound uh, sure. that we heard there. So, so Sean, thank you. I, I would say that you stumped us, but I feel like we got it towards the end there. We were at least close. <laughs> after after a half dozen hints or so, you know, we yeah. really started to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you want right. to be like Sean, go ahead and shoot us an email. Uh, we need the year, make, model, and any mods that you made to the bike. We need the sound of the bike starting up. Make sure you turn the turn signals off, Sean. <laughs> And uh, and just let the bike idle for a little bit. Give us a couple good revs, and then let the bike idle down at the end. Um, and that's what we're looking for. But thank you, right. Sean, and thank you for those of you at uh, at home playing along. Indeed, with the engine sound guessing game. Indeed, uh, we we just been dragged out a little longer because we were we were we were uh, we were struggling there. So, anywho, moving on to the uh, free t-shirt this t-shirt giveaway here which as a friendly reminder the way you get a free t-shirt is to leave a review on apple Podcasts, which makes us feel good usually and uh, also allegedly helps with uh, some amount of distribution of the show and uh, findability of your favorite motorcycling podcast this time around the winner spurgeon dunbar uh, apparently just mashed the keyboard (laughs) jdfdjgk Exactly. Um, JDFDJJK says, I appreciate that the team at High Side Low Side frequently discusses and values rider training. I had not heard of American Supercamp before this, and now I'm signed up to go in October, hoping I can get a shirt in time to wear there. Love the show. Keep it up. Right on. Well, we can't do anything for someone who is going to a rider training course, but provide them a free t-shirt, right Spurge? I mean, we actually talked about this with Sarah today. You know, instead of spending $8,000 on her track bike, she should uh, maybe take some rider training and then mm-hmm. and then figure out you know where she wants to go from there. So Zach and I are very much proponents of becoming uh, better riders first. And I think that there's so many great education programs out there um, for all different disciplines of riding. So for all of you listening, no matter how good you are, you could always be a little bit better. Go take a <laughs> go take a rider training course. That's right. Be like J D F D J G K and uh, go to American Super Camp. And um, I'm not gonna say your name again, but if you recognize that review that you left, then please send your mailing address and t-shirt size to high side low side at revzilla.com. We will send you a t-shirt you can wear proudly to American Super Camp. All righty. And the final piece of the puzzle today is the high side, low side comment. This was an email that came in from Daniel uh, H. And says, I was scrolling Instagram when Zach Quartz's story came up of him riding Spurge's Sally the Rally KTM 790 off-road by himself. First of all. Okay, let's try not to get too distracted. It's a KTM 890. Sorry. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, yeah. Let's just move it along here. <laughs> I, assume... I don't need a tirade about the difference between a 790 and 890. Oh, my God. I, was, I assumed he was riding solo only because Ari Henning was at the gym for three to five hours curling 80-pound weights and couldn't join him on the ride. Uh, I find it hard to round up friends to ride with me off-road. On top of that, I work from home, so my schedule allows me to ride midweek when most of my friends are stuck at work. I struggle with wanting to be a responsible rider, but I also want to ride off-road more often. How do you guys feel about riding off-road solo? Is there a rule of thumb um, that you stick to, i.e. Uh, a type of trail, distance, type of bike, etc.? This is a great question, Love which it. is why we picked it, <laughs> because we're very smart and handsome people. I think that the bottom line here, what we need to say first of all, is that Daniel, you have a very, very good mindset. I'm glad that you, when you ride off road, you have it in the back of your head that, hmm, maybe this isn't the best idea because you understand that you're off somewhere remote, somewhere where you're hard to find. If you fall and you and you uh, you know disable yourself in some way, that it would be hard to get home. It would be hard to 
for people to find you or something like that. So very much appreciate you bringing this topic up because it is important. And Spurge, I would just like to say that one of the people that I rode with at Get On Adventure Fest Mojave just a, a couple few weeks ago here um, was a fellow named Craig, I believe, who was on a, a Tenere 700 and who had ridden uh, track days and street bikes and had a GSXR and uh, this, that, and the other thing. Pretty good rider, but had never really been off-road. Bought himself a Yamaha Tenere 700, started doing a little bit of off-road. He went off-road by himself once and immediately thought, hmm, this isn't great. I probably shouldn't be doing this by myself. So then he came to get on Adventure Fest, where we ride together in groups and hang out and talk about technique and um, share granola bars and that kind of thing. So people do have this in mind, and it's a really important facet of uh, keeping yourself safe when you ride off-road. So to uh, all great information, to Daniel's point, it sounds like, you know, Daniel's not, you know, he has some friends that he might ride with on the weekends, but he's looking to be able to go out in the weekday. Um, Daniel, I, I am very much like you in that regard, in the fact that I have a group of friends. I like to go out. I do preach the virtues of riding off-road with other people there. Um, just in the simple fact that if you get stuck and you're by yourself, it's hard to get a bike out of a mud hole. It's hard to pick up a bike mm, sometimes true. in the wrong situation. And, and you know, I, I do carry a spot tracking device with me. I do so try... That's something that we need to land on, I think, for, yes. pretty specifically. That's something yep. that you should consider if you want to ride by yourself is some sort of GPS tracking device that will allow you to send a text message to loved ones or even call for emergency medical help anywhere that you are in the world. And they provide the insurance. So like Garmin InReach uh, spot tracker, you know, if you get stuck somewhere, if you get hurt somewhere, uh, you can push a button and they come and they get you and they bail you out. So I, I, that's the nuclear option, though, Daniel. Right. Like if, if you if you're <laughs> right. out by yourself and you get your adventure bike or your dirt bike stuck in a mud puddle, I probably wouldn't be hitting the the spot Send tracking a helicopter. device. <laughs> exactly. So so that's the that is something that I think, like Zach said, it's worth saying. Carry a spot tracker or an in reach uh, device with you for emergencies. However, my general rule of thumb is to just turn the volume down on my riding. I still go out, I ride solo. Accidents can always happen. Um, that's what the tracking device is for. But just go at 70% of, of full volume and and not, you know, the who live at Leeds, like is, is my rock reference for all of you uh, <laughs> classic rock fans out there. So I, I think there's a way to do it responsibly, um, but it's also knowing your own limitations. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's also... Uh, worth mentioning um, that uh, you could get a, a specific GPS tracking device that, um, that that can send a helicopter at the press of a button. But also there's a, there's a sort of a middle ground there. Like what I did when I was riding Spurgeon's uh, 890 rally there uh, off by myself because Ari was at the gym, as you said, <laughs> um, was to just tell my wife and one or two of my coworkers that I was going to this place. I said, this is where I'm going and you should be able to see me on your like, sort of like find my friends on, uh, on, uh, Apple, like my iPhone or whatever, or whatever the equivalent is for Android. Um, and if I'm not back by a certain time, then something has gone wrong. And so, you know, just sort of like basic information give to give to people so that they know where you're going and they know that if you haven't come back to look for you there, that's also, that's like not as expensive and not as, um, ultimately not as, safe as having a, a button that you can press to send a helicopter or EMTs. But uh, that's another thing you can do. I, and I, I would just say all of this is great information uh, from Zach, from myself. We're, we're, we're giving a lot of pearls uh, of wisdom for you out there, Daniel. Um, know how to work on your bike, at least the basics. Like if you're riding in a group and you get a flat tire, you've got three or four other people there to help you. Like if you don't know how to fix a flat tire on the side of the trail by yourself, uh, you're right. you're going to be in a, in a rough spot too. So I would just say making sure that you know some of the basics is is probably a good rule of thumb as well. But I, I think that's that's pretty much that's pretty much it. Yeah. Is, is keep so, your keep your riding a little bit more mellow. Make yep. sure you have some kind of a of a spot or emergency device on there. Make sure your loved ones know where you're at, uh -huh. and uh, you know don't don't be uh, illiterate when it comes to being able to read your service manual and changing a, a tire or two on the side of the trail. There you have it. Good advice all around, I would say there, Spurge and Dirge. So um, I think that brings us to the end of the show. This is where we remind you that if you're watching on YouTube, to please leave a comment uh, if you have uh, anything interesting to say. 
Uh, please do send other comments or engine sounds to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. Share the podcast with your friends. And um, and I think all that that leaves, Spurge, is um, is to reflect on this uh, on this episode here. A little you know South what? Park uh, moment here. What, yeah. what did you what did you what do you feel like you learned? I'm i I'm spending most of my time reflecting on a VFR 800. Um, <laughs> joking aside, I, I really am. Like that's a bike that I think I think back very fondly on the rides that I've done and and the trips that I've had. I, I oftentimes have people on Instagram that send me VFR 800 ads. Um, most recently <laughs> there was great. a, there was like a yellow one outside of Chicago that like the dude was like, Hey man, I can, I can pick this up and keep it in my garage for you if you're interested. <laughs> um, so like, I, I like the fact that that's kind of a thing the same way versus 650 is something that I think, you know, people know that you and, and Spencer and, and Ariel kind of gravitate towards that as, sure. a, as a fun bottle. But yeah, I think that, uh, I, I, there's so many cool bikes out there. And I think this episode is always fun for me. Because you can start thinking about used motorcycles. You can start start thinking about, you know, if you only have five thousand dollars and you could only spend that amount of money, there's so many cool bikes that you can get. And I think that's my big reflection and takeaway. Whether it's a VFR 800 or a '90s KLR 650, there's there's a lot of fun you can be had out there for five grand in your pocket. Mm, indeed. What about you? Not a bad throw. Not a bad throw to CTXP episode, which is now live. And uh, you, don't forget to watch that, folks. Good time. Spurgeon Dunbar is in that episode. So is Jen Dunstan and Ari Henning and Zach Quartz himself, as well as Patrick Garvin, who jumps a Ninja 400, a bike that we talked about on today's <laughs> podcast. Oh. What about you? Any any takeaways from this uh, from this podcast? Well, I didn't know what a jazz cigarette was, and now I learned that it has the devil's <laughs> lettuce in it. I didn't realize Did it was you, a cigarette that, that was you made do of the, Google the that? wacky tobacco. <laughs> uh, you live in California, man. I know. I'm just, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a weed smoking man. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't know. I, I'm not a drug addict like you are. So I, I didn't know. <laughs> I'm just a that. jazz aficionado. That's true. You know, You're into music, not so yeah, much into yeah, yeah. smoking weed. I like to wake well, up on a Sunday morning and put a West Montgomery album on and, uh, you know, just get high <laughs> as a kite and start my day. <laughs> <sighs> okay, everybody. Well, uh, hopefully most of you are more are cultured enough to know that a jazz cigarette, what a jazz cigarette was before this podcast, but I learned something today and Spurge makes a good point that gosh, darn, it's a good time to be shopping for a motorcycle, whatever budget you have. Um, thanks for sticking around. Anything else Spurge, before we send the folks home? Do I, do I, we talk about this as like the, the wrap up <laughs> moment, but you know, it's, I think it's, we can leave it with, you know, a rest in peace to, uh, to Jerry. Jerry passed away recently. Springer. All oh, right, this is supposed to be our Jerry Springer moment, but Jerry Springer died. So, so this should, I guess that's it should forever be the Jerry Springer moment now because yeah. in in his honor. Yeah, we'll let this live on in his honor because all of the Jerry <laughs> Springer fans that are now listening to High Side Low Side, it, it's got to sure. be a good crossover audience. Right, right. All, all <laughs> to the Jerry Springer <laughs> estate. You're welcome for us dedicating this part of the High Side Low Side podcast uh, <laughs> to. <laughs> to Jerry's honor. Okay, like everybody, that's all the time we've got. I'm not ending this. I'm not asking yeah. Spurge if he's got anything else to say. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out with us. We'll see you next time on High Side, Low Side, everybody. <laughs>